Hey, welcome to another episode of uh, Verbal Laxative. Uh, I'm gonna do something a little different today. Uh, it's me, Zinzin. I gotta fill <laughs> uh, the monthly quota we have for uploading, so I thought might as well just do something random then. And uh, I bring to you our a little mini series I wanna call Discount History, where I will just give a half ass casual story on something historical that you know that I've interested in and we'll just roll with it um well I guess we could start it off like this I have s some questions that were given to me that uh, some people want answered um I wouldn't go with that and maybe in the future if there's any other weird questions and stuff on that I see uh, <laughs> or ridiculous ones, uh, maybe take a go at it, but anyways, um, let's start it off, shall we? And, you know, this is just a filler episode, and it's just, fucking, it's in the name, right? <laughs> Discount history, so, um, if anybody doesn't like what I say, pfft, Whatever, who cares? <laughs> it doesn't affect your life, doesn't it? <laughs> it's really my opinion, I guess. Um, Alright, let's get started. And this is going to be a special treat, since um, it's going to be October 1st very soon, and, and that will be Chinese National Day, so let's do an episode on that. Alright, let's roll it. The commies are coming, the commies are coming, call the CIA, call the fucking police, call anybody. Oh my god. <laughs> next uh we got one from uh my good buddy and friend of the show and frequent guest billy uh his question is well his request is more like do one on chiang kai-shek a world where he actually became leader uh so all right so let's let's play a scenario where he well let's just say if he was going to if he instead won the civil war uh, all right, let's kind of go into this a little bit of background. Actually, you know what? Before we go into the background, let's just state what would this alternate history would look like. Um, I would, would say it would look like a mess. It would look like a fucking just a dog shit country. Uh, <laughs> it would look like a circus, quite honestly. And uh, the I'll go into why this would probably turn out this way. This guy wasn't that good of a... He was kind of a clown as a, of a leader. You know what? You know what? Let's pretend we try to be uh, a little bit more um, nice to him. Let's just pretend we're his friend and we evaluate him as if we're a friend of his. <laughs> trying to be... Oh. Alright, so... <clears throat> and if, if we're going to answer this question like the whole way... We're going to have to go through a little bit of Mao Zedong's history as well because we've got to contrast these two people in order to answer this question and what happened and the entire, all the events that come from it. So let's just start with Chiang Kai-shek and I have a feeling this is going to take a while. <laughs> um, so Chiang Kai-shek was from a pretty wealthy family. He, is, he was from uh, I don't know, somewhere in Zhejiang or Ningbo, but... That around that area is like the Jiangnan area, and for people that aren't really familiar with like this uh, cult, you know, the, the Chinese culture or the geography or the trends of even the current trends, but the the historical kind of trends, that area is the relatively wealthy area of China. If you can imagine, like the Hamptons in New York or where the fuck, right, or Beverly Hills, as a wealthy neighborhood and and what kind of people it attracts in L.A. Um, well, Jiangnan was in a really grand fucking perspective, 
yeah, that was like the rich area of China, right? Like, so you got abundant fertile soil historically. You got uh, really, you know, good uh, high val- high yield crops and good farming seasons. Good everything, just a whole shit ton of everything. Good, you can uh, more much more relatively easier uh, get a surplus of in that area, and also historically a lot of clans or rich clans would kind of like move to the area and set up roots and then they would get you know they would set up their influence and and get wealthy in those areas it was known kind of like you know fucking the literati sort of uh area sort of place to be if you're from uh Jiangnan, right you know like if you're a poet <laughs> You know, like the the environment was conducive to people pursuing a life of poetry and shit like that. Where you know you don't have to farm every day to make sure you gotta um, you gotta survive. Of course, there's still the farmers there, the peasants and shit, right? And they still gotta toil every day. They got it relatively easier than probably other more arid parts of China, especially in the north and then going further west. But Jiangnan, yeah, like peasants usually got a bumper. A decent okay crop, and if there were famines, usually Jiangnan wouldn't see famines like that. But yeah, that's a general overview. I mean, it's not 100% like that all the time, but that's kind of the area where Chiang Kai shek's family came from. Um, and also, the pronunciation of Chiang Kai shek, it's kind of fucked up, I know. Like in Chinese, in Mandarin, his name is Jiang Jie Shi. And in Taiwan, you know, if you're like a Chiang Kai-shek fanboy, you would call him by his more prestigious whatever name, uh, Jiang Zhongzheng. So then in Taipei, you know, when you get to the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall, it's called uh, Zhongzheng Ji Nian Tang, if I remember correctly. Nobody on the mainland <laughs> that's not dumb would call Chiang Kai-shek Jiang Zhongzheng. You know, and and then nobody in Chinese speaking areas will call him Chiang Kai Shek, right? It's this kind of, unless, you know, you are from, I guess, maybe Guangdong when you're speaking Cantonese. Because that's probably where the English name came from. And I know I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but um, the, it, there's kind of an explanation why some of these names are kind of fucked up during this period of time. And then later on, when like Pinyin is. Establish it's a lot more standardized, like the the transliteration of Chinese names into English. Chiang Kai Shek, um, I think this name got English sized They got transliterated to English during the time when he was kind of establishing his base in uh, Guangdong. So I think that's when the Western press got like kind of found out who the fuck is this guy, you know, and then his name got propagated as Chiang Kai Shek. I'm assuming. That's what his name was pronounced like that in, in Cantonese over there. But I could be wrong. I have no idea <laughs> if that's not the case. Uh, it's just fucked up name. Like, even people in Taiwan, they don't call him. In Mandarin, there's no... Or or all the, you know, like, Minanhua, Minan uh, dialect, or the other dialect, Hokkien dialects in uh, Taiwan, they don't call Chiang Kai-shek Chiang Kai-shek. It's Jiang Jie Shi or some version of it. Anyways, but for sake of English, fucking call him Chiang Kai Shek. I might go in between, but you know, it's the same guy we're talking about. Same with Guomindang, you know, KMT Guomindang. Sun Zhongshan, Sun Yatsen, same thing. Anyways, this guy was from one of those richer areas. His family is a rich, more relatively well off, rich, snobby sort of deal family, um, from what it sounds like. And uh, from a young age, when he was born, him and Mao Zedong were kind of born around the same period, the same generation. It was still under the Qing dynasty. And so when they were born, it was basically right at the tail end of this collapse of the dynasty. So that their youth and their teenage years were filled with just China getting its shit handed to them. Right. And, you know, this 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 cultural proudness of this long uh, glorious civilization just you know brought to his knees by just fucking what they perceive as you know just the fucking outside the foreigners or, or whatever right and so at that time when they were coming of age it was like the hardcore original version of make china great again right before mega was even a thing here you know mega hype mega on cocaine was what china was like during the final years of the Qing. 
and just trying to throw overthrow those shackles of feudalism to try to even stay alive during this you know this this intrusion of uh, foreign much more powerful foreign powers there's no way you know the thing was basically on life support it was gasping and this was their coming of age and affected both of them uh, in 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 the same way where it would kind of give him this indignation and this drive to kind of go try and do something. And this was what a lot of people at that time were kind of feeling. Um, What Chiang Kai-shek did was uh, he eventually made his way to go study in Japan, study military uh, at a military school. And uh, the, the reason why some of these people would go to Japan to study was at the time Japan when Japan beat the Qing dynasty in that 1984 uh, Jiawu Zhanzheng in English it's just called the 1898 no, sorry 1894 Sino-Japanese War but Chinese is Jiawu because it falls within the period of, of, of Jiawu which is I don't want to explain what, what the fuck that means it, it doesn't matter they Japan kind of whooped Qing's ass, and then you know, like Qing China's ass, and um, Qing China at that point was really humbled because before then, like Japan, there was no way Japan could even do that to China, right? Probably one, two, three historical wars, all times Japan kind of just got fucking owned, right? Um, so this humbled, like, imagine if like the United States lost against Mexico. That would be kind of like the holy shit moment. But at that point, some people were, especially the rebels and revolutionaries, were looking to Japan as kind of like a role model of what something China could do to try to modernize itself, right? Japan was an, kind of relatively, it was an old Asian country that was following more or less these Confucian ideals, more or less, right? So they thought, well, if they could modernize, we could try to follow them. So revolutionaries like Sun Yat-sen, Chiang Kai-shek, people, a lot of people before them as well, prominent people, would kind of go to Japan to sort of either go to school um, or set up, or if they were like in exile from China, they would go to Japan as, as like dissidents, exiled dissidents to hang out and fucking talk about revolution there. So when he went, uh, he, I think he rolled in the Imperial Japanese Army, one of the uh, one of their academies, uh, and for a couple of years, he stayed there and you know um, did the uh, whole schooling for the for like an officer corps, right? Um, after he finished that, I think I think he got pretty proficient in Japanese and made a lot because he he this will later show up during when he has to fight. Japan, but he made a lot of buddies in Japan, and he kind of like more or less under got more familiar with the Japanese mindset and the whole country's um, trend in Japan at that time, and what they were their politics were kind of trending towards. He had an idea of what they what was going on there, what was what those what they wanted to do, and what they could possibly want to do uh, in regards to you know like the geopolitics for Japan. And so he got really familiar with that country, made some buddies, and then came home uh, to participate in the uh, startings of the revolution in China with the, to overthrow the, the Qing dynasty. So he came back, I think he was came back to be an artillery officer starting out, and then he kind of moved his ranks up as the revolution started fucking rolling right and then by the time you know it became it's it just started snowballing uh around closer to 1911 it was just people were just you know tired of tired of tired of like the Qing dynasty's shit and it's just multiple places started to simultaneously uh like spontaneously but also in some planned simultaneous um events started to rebel secede from the Qing and just fucking open rebellion, right? Seeing that at that time, <laughs> if it was, um, the emperor at the time was a boy, uh, Pu Yi, Emperor Pu Yi, I think his, he was the Xuantong Emperor. Uh, there's a movie made about him, it's called The Last Emperor, and it shows him as a kid, and all these fucking officials are just shitting their pants, right? 
um, at this fucking calamity that's about to befall the country, and they gotta take orders basically from a kid. Um, I think whoever was regent at the time, it was Empress Long Yu. I think was Empress at the time, and then she was kind of shooting bricks, and you know she was worried that she was gonna end up her and the rest of the Qing royal family is gonna end up like Marie Antoinette and Louis. You know, 16th, just going to the guillotine. Because these rebels were basically going to win. So they kind of negotiated, like, uh, an abdica- abdication at around 1911. You know, please, you know, let us live and you guys can have your republic, more or less, right? And at the time, the strong man, who was this uh, this general in the Qing court called Yuan Shikai, he had massed the whole... He, he was he was very powerful general at that point because he was he got the entire like Qing uh, Beiyang army under his command right and basically he cut a deal when the nationalists and the revolution was going on and it was forcing the Qing to kind of like give up um, they kind of made a deal with Yuan Shikai because he was pretty fucking strong up in the north still Qing Dynasty is probably going to lose, but, you know, like, if you can get Yuan Shikai to kind of, like, also, you know, kind of come to terms, it's much easier. You know, a lot less uh, fucking bloodshed could go on. They made a deal with Yuan Shikai, and, uh, you know, he w- they would get the Qing to abdicate, but he would become the president, right? Um, so that's what happened, but then maybe shortly into his term, he started thinking hey you know what i should just become emperor again so he became emperor and then rebellions started happening all over again and it wasn't that long he died shortly after right this sets up the stage for chiang kai shek's sort of fucking name to start to start to make a name for himself in china so at that point yuan shikai makes a fool of himself declares himself emperor after the Qing abdicates and then fucking dies probably of just cringe at that point right um Literally, I'm not. I'm not joking. He he declared himself emperor, and then fucking that failed. Everybody started to re rebel against him, and then he just he fucking died, it, from health reasons, health from being unhealthy because of cringe. So the country kind of falls into another period of almost civil war again, right? You got the northern uh, army of Yuan Shikai kind of fracturing into. Uh, you know, warlord armies again, and these warlord armies, you know, they would, they would, they would come to be like the kind of block that would form the adversaries for the Guomindang's uh, northern expedition. Um, one important thing to note is Mao Zedong, uh, like Chiang Kai Shek, was going up the ranks. He was an artillery officer, started making up, uh, going up s- into like more senior positions, and he started. He made friends with Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen was like. At the very least, he was like the nominal figurehead, uh, so, uh, I, uh, personality for, uh, like the mascot, if you will, of the revolution. Right? It's no, he wasn't like some fuck. He wasn't like the commander in chief of all the different rebellious armies. Some of them nominally, you know, nationalist Guomindang. Some others were just you know the local fucking Beiyang army, you know, Feng Tian army, and all those guys. But he was kind of like the face, uh, the mascot of the idea of revolution, right? He had a lot of prestige, is basically what it is. Um, he befriended, Sun Yat-sen befriended Chiang Kai-shek. They sort of hit it off. And, you know, um, Sun Yat-sen at that point when Yuan Shikai uh, declared himself emperor, Sun Yat-sen was furious, right? He was fucking pissed off. So at that, at that point, he was like, you know what, I can't trust... Like, I can't trust these deals. I can't trust just negotiating with people of power. We need to have... And we need to basically get it ourselves. And we need to get it ourselves through fucking military power as well, right? So, the the Guomindang was resolutely now, you know, decided, you know, even after this revolution, we still, we, we gotta be in the business of growing an army and keeping our army and being armed revolutionary party right so, but at the time nobody they wanted to kind of get support from the outside world but nobody really wanted to support them they didn't really care for them right they 
most of the European powers wanted to do deals with whoever was in charge of Beijing. So at the time, Yuan Shikai, you know, they would want to do deals with him, and yeah, he'd fucking roll over, bend over for anything. It was great. But now that he's gone and the whole country is going to shit again, like fucking, they're they're kind of sitting back waiting to see who would come out this top dog. But uh, there was <coughs> one Western well, European power that would uh, that was going to um, I guess take the take the risk and and get themselves um, offer some assistance. So that was the Soviet Union. At a time when the Nationalist Party in China, at the time when they were kind of fucking wanting to get any kind of support whatsoever, literally the Russians were kind of like the only outside power that were willing to kind of help them, China, in their quest for revolution, right? And before we set that up, at this time, you know, Mao Zedong, who was more or less Chiang Kai-shek's contemporary, he was in completely different circumstances. Whereas Chiang Kai-shek was more was in a, from a privileged family, privileged station in life that he could get in touch with these people of power, people of influence, and fucking just make his <laughs> make his way up. Mao Zedong was basically a peasant, a uh, son of a peasant, right? His dad was considered maybe a well-off, sort of okay, more well-off to do peasant that can do like that had enough money to lend out usuries to people, but still peasant, right? Fucking grew up poor, farmed, um, barely, couldn't really, basically, like, kind of taught himself to try to, and educated himself. Um, He found his way, though, because he eventually found his way to become, like, the assistant at at a library in uh, Beijing University. Um, before then, he was also um, wanting. He was full of you know passion and shit. That young person's fucking feeling of wanting to do something, and he was seeing the country going to shit. And he tried to, you know, he was um, trying to see what he could do for his part to fucking make it better, like Chiang Kai Shek was thinking at the time. Uh, and in the beginning, he read a lot of stuff. You know, he was he was a believer. He started to be a believer in like liberalism and stuff. And then he also joined the local Hunan militia, uh, warlord army for a time too. But he was too young, and kind of like the overthrow of the Qing was a little bit too fast. He kind of missed that. But he was in the warlord army. Realized that it was really nothing there for him. So he tried to find some ways to be to. To, to, to do other things and then eventually he made his way where you know prominent thinkers uh, these people would kind of take notice of him because he was a smart guy he was a very impressionable uh, young guy at the time so people like the some of these OG Marxists in China like uh, Yang Changji and Li Dazhao um, Yang Changji uh, I think he Mao uh, at some point as he got older, he I think he went with Li Dazhao to Beijing to be his assistant at Beijing at the library at Beijing University, and then Yang Changji was um, he, he became he also became close with Yang Changji later on because he eventually would marry Yang Changji's daughter Yang Kaihui, uh, and then well, well, there's definitely a lot more on that and fucking there there is a fucking soap drama story big <laughs> storyline there um but we'll get to there later the, basically the point was they Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong these two guys came are started at very different stations in life and they will eventually become arch enemies right this is their fucking origin stories that they're coming up and you'll see through progression like Chiang Kai-shek sort of get he has the access he and he's got a little bit of uh, political acumen as well yeah, but he's got this first and foremost he has all these resources and access available to him influ- and and connections to make his way up top and he'll use these to great effect too but the point is he has these in the beginning Mao Zedong didn't have none of these but he got his way up to like um, the top echelon of the communist party especially during a time when they were close to being wiped out through li- through just his abilities 
right? Like he was proven right. Chiang Kai-shek was, you'll see that connections played a, a, a substantial part in that. Um, yeah, what's well, the next point? I mean, like, <laughs> to the point where, like, he actually marries into Sun Yat-sen's family as well. Sun Yat-sen married a woman from herself, a prominent family. Her name was Song Qinling, and she was from a very rich family, the Song family, right? So you got guys that were, that would basically be, like, the who's who of, like, the big shots of Republican-era China, you know, like, uh, uh, Song Ziwen would... Be f- eventually be the finance minister because his dad was just so fucking loaded, right? That's Song Jinling's brother. Song Ailing, who fucking marries another banker, right? H.H. H. Kung. Anybody know that guy? Fucking <laughs> That guy was, um, I think his Chinese name is uh, Kong Xiangxi or whoever. I don't remember it uh, too well, but um, that guy was fucking, he was from like a loaded, fa- like these were the who's who of like the, the nobility. Right uh, during the Republican era, uh, the Song family was, I think, her dad was uh, uh, made a name for himself in America, got pretty rich there, got uh, was really uh, well connected to the local, I think, the Methodist church of wherever you was at, and then saw an opportunity to kind of return back to China, um, and you know, t- take his family back to China and try to uh, fucking build something up there Song Qingling was one of his daughters her sister Song Ailing married the Kong the rich H.H. Kong Kong Xiangxi Xiangxi I think uh, I gotta search up his name it's gonna bug me Kong H.H. what's his name how do you pronounce it let's look at the Chinese part that's how we're gonna know yeah Kong Xiangxi Xiangxi <laughs> Kangxi, the Si, Kong Xiangxi. Alright. And then her other sister, and this will be important, Song Meilin marries Chiang Kai shek. Song Qinlin, so, uh, a sister, Song Meilin marries Chiang Kai shek. And there's an old saying in China where it's like the Song sister's saying, right? Um, you know, like Song Ailing married for, uh, loved money, Song Meilin loved power, and then Song Qinlin loved the country. Because Song Qingling was the only sister that stayed in China after the People's Republic was established. But anyways, I get fucking too ahead of myself sometimes. So at the time, Chiang Kai-shek, Sun Yat-sen become literally best bros. Uh, yeah, pretty much family fucking in-laws and shit. And he rises in the... He gets a lot of prestige from this. He kind of rises in the ranks, right? It's especially... After Sun Yat-sen dies, um, I th- he died in around the 1920s, I want to say 25. Um, basically, the revolution was nowhere near done. The country's fractured. This guy, who is has quite a bit of prestige among the, uh, the revolutionaries and rebellious elements, and the National Party itself, uh, dies. So then, who are the successors? So at this time, it was around like 1925, one of the two people the big the big guys that would be vying for power would be a guy named uh, Wang Jingwei and uh, obviously Chiang Kai-shek Wang Jingwei was a pretty big deal in the in the Kuomintang party he was he came along with Sun uh, and a fucking uh, got his chops uh, along with it with uh, Sun Yat-sen when during the revolution doing lots of this revolutionary work he um him and Chiang Kai-shek did not like each other. Uh, Wang Jingwei was more amenable to working with a lot more leftist elements, and he was seen as more as like more of like the civilian member of the party, uh, like uh, the political uh, face of it all. Chiang Kai-shek was seen as more of the military arm of the party. So he was the fucking he was the guy with the guns. Wang Jingwei was kind of seen as the guy with the you know, the brains, I guess, whatever the fuck you would call it. At this, th- and remember, during this time, uh, Kuomintang was still heavily supported by the Soviet Union, because no one else wanted to support them. Um, the Soviet Union helped the Kuomintang set up, like, a military academy. It, it helped organize the party along, like, a Leninist party lines, where it's like, uh, it, it was kind of like the vanguard party mold, right? 
Guomindang members would kind of decide on a, they would decide on a course of action internally, and once you know they would have debate, discussion, whatever, just like a Soviet sort of a, uh, uh, kind of like the Soviet Leninist model. They would have their debates, discussions. They'd be like, "Oh, you're an idiot. No, you're a fuck you." But the, at the end, after all the debate is done, they decide on something. The whole party has to be united and do whatever. So they got a lot of these elements and organizational tips from the Soviet Union, and they also set up their army in kind of the same way, uh, like how the Soviets uh, kind of taught them. They set up an academy in uh, in Guangdong. It was called Huangpu Military Academy, and in English, is really it's it's spelled really fucked up. It's like W H A M P O A. Looks like Huangpu. But, you know, that's just the fucked up... Like I said, at this time, it was the fucked up pronounced, uh, spelling for these things in English. Established Huangpu Military Academy and Chiang Kai-shek, while Sun was alive, Sun appointed him as like the commandant, like the principal, the dean of this uh, military school. So he, you know, like like I said, you know, he, he's got the connections, you know, and he gets appointed to these... Uh, uh, prestigious and very uh, influential um, posts, and especially at Huangpu, uh, Jiang Jiang Kai Shek Jiang Jie Shi, um, basically builds up like a cadre of really loyal uh, officers and 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 gen- future generals that will serve in his army, and it's this like loyal core of his officers, his Huangpu homies, right? Ironically enough, Zhou Enlai was also. Um, Zhou Enlai was, which is one of, one of the most important like communist Chinese Communist Party members going into the modern, uh, you know, later on. Very influential, like probably like second at times second or third most powerful after Mao Zedong, after you know when the communists won. Zhou Enlai was also you know a, uh, part of the Kuomintang and he was part of the political fucking political action department of Huangpu Academy or something like that. He was the head of that department. So it's it's ironic these guys are going to go go at each other's throats later on, but you know at the, at that time they're fucking directors at this at this military school. And it's because at that time also, you know, the communists more or less joined with the Kuomintang as one like body uh, Gomindang was made up of a mo- lot more people uh, than what it became. When it when it started, it was seen as a genuine kind of like revolutionary party. Uh, even when even when the communists were kind of made their own small little party in in Shanghai in in uh, twenty one, um, like they were still viewed like oh, okay, our best shot at doing any kind of change is to kind of align with the Gomindang, ally with them, and go go ahead with revolution right and plus the theory for them you know they they would adopt the theories uh a lot of the marxist theories too where it's like okay well if we recognize that china is a feudal society a backwards feudal society right now then according to like the leninist and marxist leninism or our theory it's you know you got on your on on your evolution of society towards communism you got to you know you got to go from feudalism capitalism or whatever right you gotta take those steps to get there so then they would you know the people would reason saying well the, if you ally with the Gomina overflow overthrow the Qing you know that's that's in keeping with this the orthodoxy um, so what happened was um, after the Communist Party was made uh, in, in 21 um, the decision was kind of it kind of grew from the the members themselves, and also uh, at this time, the Soviet Union had like a almost like an international outreach sort of deal with their own communist international uh, sort of or, uh, organizing. So what they would do, what the Soviet Union would do, was would be like the common turn, as it was called, would try to support uh, like communist revolutionaries in all these other countries outside the Soviet Union. So then, they obviously have a big interest to make sure um, that you know, like, if 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 a communist revolution were to happen in China, you know, hopefully it would be a, a friendly country to the Soviet Union, it wouldn't be ideo- ideologically hostile, and you know, to have 
that on your borders, they feel like it would be an important thing. So, so there's a bunch of there was a bunch of communists, uh, budging, bur, like budding communists that were um in China that were also uh educated in the Soviet Union. So there's a bunch, a lot actually, <laughs> um. Like uh, famous ones, you know, like uh, Bo Gu, Wang Ming, those guys that will feature prominently later on. That you know, like, kind of didn't when they came up about they didn't like Mao Zedong, and they they were perceived as the 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 hot shots at the time because you know, oh look at these fancy lads coming from Moscow directly from those Moscow schools, right? And then they looked down on kind of like the na the local uh, communist members. I mean, like, what do you know? You know, you're not fancy fucking lad like me, because uh, you guys didn't go to Moscow to learn whatever, right? But I digress. The whole point was, anyways, uh, like the Soviet Comintern uh, had uh, in the beginning because of these people coming back. These guys were like the 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 you know like the orthodox um, Soviet trained Marxist. Uh, they thought that, you know, like, oh, we're in a good position to guide the local Communist Party people. Um, and the local Communist Party people also thought, hey, uh, the Kuomintang is the best, uh, right now is looking good, is our best shot at doing whatever. Revolution. These two were kind of aligned. Um, so they would all, they would kind of join the Kuomintang from uh, the direction of, you know, the Communist Party of China and also from the Comintern uh, P- uh, influence people uh, that were trained in Moscow, right? Or had uh, affiliations with the Comintern. Uh, and also, this is under the general Soviet Union direction was, uh, hey, we're going to we're gonna give active assistance to the Kuomintang. So the Kuomintang was... Uh, had a had a really big base because it covered a, a lot of people at this at this point in time. So you, not only did you have like you know what would be traditionally called like the capitalist bourgeoisie, um, you know like landowners, uh, capitalists, and all those guys, um, but also like workers, students, intellectuals, um, left leaning uh, like the masses as well, more or less. Except the the peasants weren't really. Um, the peasants weren't really paid too much attention to at this time. It was a lot of orthodoxy, you know, like, like the the boilerplate Marxist stuff at this uh, during this period, where which was concentrated on like urban proles, right? O- urban proletariat workers in in the cities. Um, and it will take like the actual creation of the birth of this of Mao Zedong's like uh, style. To actually harness the peasants, and that would be the crucial thing in China, because that was ninety percent of the people. But you know, like that's down the line, and most of these people didn't really care about that. Like the communists, the leftists themselves didn't, you know, focused on workers, workers' strikes, and all that. And then while on the other side, the right wing of the Kuomintang was were uh, focused on, like, you know. Yeah, I guess nowadays it's the comprador class, but it was mostly like the landowners and uh, military guys and uh, the people of power and and stuff like that. And they, they were committed to kind of just overthrowing the old monarchy, the old thing, right? Um, but this ties into Wang Jingwei and uh, Chiang Kai Shek's struggle for the the leadership at the time, because like I said, Wang Jingwei was was more like the political the political party guy. Chiang Kai shek was the military guy and they were gonna to come to head for this struggle over the leadership of the party. But um kind of before it kind of like just blew up, uh Chiang Kai shek kind of maneuvered his way into the leadership too. I don't re- I remember reading a long time ago uh, what what happened? It just seems kind of stupid. It was it was almost like he sent Wang Jingwei out on a vacation. Basically, he just sent him out of the country, and then during that period of time, just fucking took that opportunity to take over for the leadership. You know, um, 
fuck, I'm too lazy to fucking double check that. <laughs> Whoever the fuck cares about it can't double check that. But in the end, it's mostly he has the advantage because he's he's the military guy. He has the loyalty of the army, especially the his his cadre that he cultivated from Huangpu Military Academy, right? So obviously this this guy was gonna hold all the cards, you know, and this should this shouldn't be a fucking surprise of a lesson. Usually, you know, like like Mao said, right? Military uh, political power grows out the barrel of the gun. This is pretty much true. Is a true no matter what, even in Western societies now, where you have like the window dressing of uh, like civility and um, you know stable elections behind. Behind all that, behind peaceful transition of power, there's always, it's always within the context of, well, the government has control of the monopoly of violence, right? Um, but let's, before we get to the, what, what, what would become called the Northern Expedition of what, like, the Kuomintang's push to kind of uh, pacify the warlords of the uh, of the scattered like Beiyang army in the north. Where was Mao Zedong in all this? Mao Zedong at this point was also <laughs> ironically a Guomindang member, right? Like he was one of the originals that kind of uh, founded that kind of joined up to the the local, like the homegrown Chinese Communist Party, where you know he never left the country before then. You know he's not like Wu Gu Wang Mei. And Wang Mang and those guys that were um, Soviet trained, right? And then, um, and this kind of worked against him in the beginning because, well, he was low ranked. But later on, when he was starting to get noticed, these guys that were uh, that were common turn guys or uh, common turn uh, trained guys, they would kind of look down upon him because he'd be like, "Oh, who's this this country bumpkin?" You know, like he doesn't well, like. He wants to fuck mobilize the peasants. That's the exact opposite of what Marx said. You know, like a very haughty sort of deal. But and and later on, he the way that you know it would turn out was while well, he Mao was pr- proven right, and the common turn guys were fucking wrong. So in the end, uh, he would you know he would ascend because fucking he would prove that he was right on all these things, especially when they're meeting almost near decimation. Due to the the mistakes of the of the common turn train guys, Chiang Kai Shek, uh, Mao Zedong, same party, and Chiang Kai Shek was actually pretty much. Uh, if you notice the station, like Mao Zedong was still kind of like you know fucking he, he was working as an assistant in a, in a library, and he's now just you know political uh, activist for the Guomindang, right? He would um, go and make do investigative reports, right, and. As like uh, you know, card carrying party membership guy, he would go to like the present rural rural areas because he was kind of, he was he was leaning towards and he was try- getting more convinced that you know what it's not the workers that's gonna uh, that's gonna be the fucking the beef the the meat of this revolution. It might just be the peasants, and he was at this formulative time he was kind of going into these places at his old home of Hunan to try to. To try to investigate, and it's a, it, this is a famous passage that he, that's in the selected works, where this is this would be like the formulative, um, like uh, investigation. And this guy Mao Zedong was really thorough in this stuff. He would look at the he would go investigate like the local, um, the happenings, like the prices. Even he he would document the prices of cigarettes, food, um, and everything that and the local in the localities, and then he would go talk to people and peasants. He was doing this work as a Guomindang member. If you notice the station in life, he was pretty much like grunt level. Chiang Kai-shek was fucking top there. He was top shelf rank, right? He was cont- vying for the leadership with uh, Wang Jinwei while Mao was kind of just doing the fucking grunt work. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I mean, he's going to do this. He does the peasant um, investigation work during in 1927 when the next big thing that's when the next big thing was going to happen and he kind of survived because he was kind of doing this stuff off and I'm going to get to it but let's get back to uh, what we were talking about um, but Chiang Kai-shek gets the power Wang, uh, Wang Jinwei kind of loses out but he's still prestigious enough he still has enough clout that 
he he still uh, Wang Jingwei still has a high position, right? Chiang Kai Shek can't really get rid of him entirely at this point. Chiang Kai Shek he gets he consolidates his power, and then now he feels it's time to move up north. Right now, the bases of the Guomindang are in Guangdong and and kind of Guangxi as well, because they he has um. He has uh, Li Zongren, which is the a warlord in Guangxi, as, um, as it's kind of like his ally as well. Later on, these guys are gonna have a bit. These guys are gonna have a falling out, and it's I don't know. I don't remember if they don't like each other already, but fucking you'll see from uh, this entire story that he fucking he has problems with anybody that comes in near his stature or level of power. But for now, he's gonna ride high, right? He now had uh, this army that was ready to go up north to to take out the rival lord, warlords in those areas up northern uh, to him. He's got backing from the Soviet Union, you know, and he, you know these guys, these commentary leaders like Mikhail Borodin and and the local Chinese communists as well were in his party. They were, the Soviet Union was giving organizational advi- advisory assistance and some material. So, you know, like he's got these, <laughs> ironically, these Soviet trained armies out of Huangpu, right, uh, ready to go for this war. And you got the communists and a lot of leftists as well just agitating uh, strikes in these uh, northern warlord area armies. And at this, at this point when we're talking about like the Guomindang in Guangdong and Guangxi, the northern... It encompasses uh, those Jiangnan areas, right? The old, like, Anhui, like, uh, Jinfa government, like, the warlord governments, and you had, like, the Hunan governments. These these counted as, the at this time, they were, like, the uh, rival warlords to the north of these guys, the, the nationalists, right? So, Chiang Kai-shek, um, with, in, in collaboration with uh, the leftists and the Soviet Union and uh, started to go up north, right? What would happen was these communi- the 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 communists and a lot of these leftist uh, Guomindang guys would pave the way first, because they would get the local population to kind of be on the side of Chiang Kai Shek's army of the Guomindang coming. They say, you know, these guys are a revolutionary army. We're gonna cut. They these guys are gonna come in and uh, sweep away these old remnant warlord cliques. Um, and you know the people kind of got they he kind of won the hearts and minds of people as he was rolling through these places. So you know he goes in uh, and takes over these areas back uh, and under Guomindang control, and the local population welcome him with open arms. Right? They would view the other like warlord cliques like from Shandong or like uh, Zhili, it would be like, oh, you know, you're. You, they would feel like they're invaders, especially in Zhejiang, right? They'd feel like, oh, the troops coming in to aid the other warlords from Shandong, kind of like outsiders, right? They, they don't really trust them. But with the the groundwork that was coming in from the the communists and the uh, the other Guomindang leftists in these areas, it built up these supports. So when the Guomindang came, they didn't really feel them as outsiders, right? They would be like, oh yeah, welcome, you know, fucking comrade and shit. So he pushed north. Him, Chiang Kai-shek, his army, and Li Zongren's uh, Guangxi clique pushed north, right? This is, this is the southern uh, Guomindang strong, uh, headquarters and stronghold at the time pushing north. This is called the Northern Expedition. And it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a famous one. It's, if it, you were looking at Chiang Kai-shek's resume, this was probably the high point. Even in Time magazine in America at the time, they, would, they ran on like the cover... Chiang Kai-shek, the re- China's red general, right? Everybody thought just because the Soviet Union was supporting the Kuomintang, this guy was fu- this guy was a communist. These, you know, the common turn has gotten their hooks into into China, right? Which is going to be laughable once uh, <laughs> they figure out how fucking strongly anti-communist this this fucker was. Um, <coughs> yeah, it's a, and he starts off with. A lot of successes, right? He pushes into uh, Wu Peifu's um, forces up in like uh, around. I think 
he was in around Hunan and all those areas, and he pushes into like uh, the Jiangnan areas into Zhejiang and his home province. He starts to push into those areas, right? And the guy in charge was uh, Sun Chuanfang. These guys were kind of panicking at that point because they were like, "Holy fuck!" You know, like we're gonna need help from uh, you from our rival warlords. You know, put put the rival uh, the rivalries they had with like. Zhili or whoever up up even more north near Beijing and uh, you know Manchuria be like and you know ask for they kind of ask for help to kind of fight this other warlord from the south the, the Chiang Kai-shek right so this kicks off a bunch of uh, battles for these areas but uh, uh, Wu Peifu and um, Sun uh, Chuanfang kind of lose out they have to, they have to retreat Chiang Kai-shek takes more, ter- you know, basically these territories and uh, and it, up north from Guangdong. Wang Jingwei's forces kind of go straight up north into Hunan and Changsha and eventually make their way to, like, Wuhan. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, everybody knows where Wuhan is now. Um, Chiang Kai-shek kind of moves more, like, northeasterly. He wants to take, you know, fucking uh, going through Fujian and Jiang, uh, Jiangxi and those guys, those provinces, to try to move his way up, uh, up north. Eventually, trying to get to Nanjing, where he's gonna set up his capital. Right. So, lots of success that they meet in here, and the the warlords get kind of pushed back, and they and they are aided in this because the Guomingdang sort of gets some like a no uh, some notional alliance from some northern warlords like. Uh, like from Feng Yuxiang, which uh, he's kind of in the area where it's like Shanxi, Inner Mongolia, you know, northern north of there, and uh, Yanxi, Yanxi Shan, which was he was uh, the warlord in Shanxi, so it was Taiyuan and those areas over there. So, you know, Wu Peifu and uh, Sun Chuan uh, Fang would kind of had to watch their backs from their northern front. Because these guys were going to come in from the north to kind of sweep them if they weren't careful as well, right? Um, so, the, the like Wu Peifu was kind of and was kind of boned, right? Um, so when Chiang Kai Shek uh, rolls into towards like Nanjing, and uh, Wang Jingwei rolls into Wuhan, Wang Jingwei sort of sets up because. The rivalry surfaces uh, prominently again where Wang Jingwei goes to Wuhan and then he is that says, hey, I st- this is now the new capital of the Guomindang. So he's kind of like taking the piss out of, uh, of uh, Chiang Kai-shek. He's saying, you know, this is the capital. You know, I'm the fucking leader. We're going to establish you here. Chiang Kai-shek doesn't really like that at all. And he's like, you know, fuck this guy, right? And he takes this opportunity uh, right when he when he rolls into Nanjing and in, into Shanghai as well, to finally be like, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna get get two birds with one stone basically. I'm gonna take care of this fucking communist problem, which because he was he didn't like communists at all. He didn't he no, it wasn't just because he doesn't like the Soviet Union or whatnot. And also keep in mind, Chiang Kai Shek also did spend some time um, after he came back from China from Japan. He did spend some time in the Soviet Union in Moscow as well, uh, in you know military schools there as well. Um, he it's not just because he didn't like the Soviet Union; he just doesn't like communism at all. And his base, you know, maybe a little bit of because of his background, or maybe just because because his viewpoints in life, or you know, uh, he doesn't like communism. He views that as probably the biggest threat to to uh, him, and he views it even bigger threats than foreign threats later on. Um, so he rolls into Shanghai and Nanjing, and then he starts what's known as the White Terror. So, literally, this is kind of he he pulls what what the uh the 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 Republic does in Star Wars in Episode Three, right? Where they just you know what was it Order sixty six or whatever, <laughs> and right on the dot turn around and start shooting all the Jedi's and whatever. He does this. He does his own version of that of the of the uh, the empires uh, purging the Jedi's. 
in the White Terror. Except it, in this case, it wasn't Jedi's. It was just basically everybody left of him. So it wasn't even just communists, but everyone that was deemed to be too left. Uh, you know, so he fucking massacres a whole lot of them in in uh, Shanghai, especially. Um, he gets his his old buddy of his um, that that was like the local the local big deal gangster in Shanghai, uh, uh, Du Yuesheng. He gets him to also to start fucking killing. Uh, union people, uh, labor unions, communists, suspected communists, everybody in Shanghai. It was it was a fucking bloodbath on that day. It was this is nineteen twenty seven, and then uh, you know does it all over the place. His own forces as well. He gets uh, like Li Zongren's uh, army to kind of come in and purge his one one of the first armies on like the uh, first army division, I think. That was in the Guomingdong. Just just because the first army had too many, like I guess, communists in their ranks, right? So it was a full cleanse, full purge, and this at the same time it it kind of sh- shat on the face of Wang Jingwei because Wang Jingwei's support had a lot. He had a lot of these left guys and the communists under his support, right? Uh, well, supporting him, and that was where his sort of influence was. Well, he kind of just got he just got pissed on from that, right? From the White Terror. And Wang Jingwei, you know, at the end, he just kind of fucking put. He kind of pansied out, and he was like, "All right, whatever. I'm, you know, what I I disassociate myself with communism as well. Uh, well, both these communists, you know, I'm fucking hardcore. Also, you know, disavow. So please don't uh, fuck me up either. So the communists get boned, and like I said, at this time, Mao Zedong was. Uh, and a stroke of luck. He wasn't anywhere near these areas where it, they were getting purged, right? If you were in Shanghai and you were a communist, it was a, it was a bad day for you. But Mao Zedong was in Hunan doing his investigative reports on like the Hunan peasant uprisings and and revolutionary councils there, right? So he kind of he didn't he kind of lucked out on that. But right when this happens. You know the communists kind of say, "Holy shit!" You know, like let's let's band together and let's like defend ourselves, right? And this became what was known as the Nan Nanchang Uprising, right? And this was the birth of the the Chinese Red Army. The the later on it would become the People's Liberation Army. This was their birth. Is on October first? No, sorry, August first, nineteen twenty seven. It was because the communists got got mowed down by you know Star Wars level old Repub- uh, republic betrayal. Um, that they're at this point they're like you know what we we need our own army we can't just fucking be at the whims of the Guomingdong we can't even be in the Guomingdong anymore right they they purged us. Nanchang uprising, you know, the armies of Judah, which would become, uh, which was a communist uh, general, and he would become a big deal later on, and uh, Zhou Enlai, you know, the former uh, director, one of the directors at Huangpu Military Academy, you know, these guys just tried to do an uprising in Nanchang, but that was unsuccessful, they kind of have to regroup. The significance is, the communists start their own military arm, and this was because Chiang Kai-shek fucking turned turned against him. If you recall, up until now, um, he basically had every he basically had all the power aligned with him with him. But he felt now like like he can't go on with this with the composition of how his party was. You know, this guy represented you know the military, and he his power base was landowning class, capitalist class. Uh, basically, everybody that had a problem or had a, a mortal fear of what these communists uh, would are are were calling for, which was you know like redistribution, you know like uh, of wealth and kind of like an eventual uh, a, you know a, a abolishment of private property. That was their Marxist theories, right? These guys were definitely scared of that, so. They, uh, Chiang Kai-shek did this and fucking, in their eyes, proved that uh, to them he, he was their savior. He was their, uh, you know, their capitalist savior. And they were going to 
uh, throw in all their chips with him. Um, and he, you know, like the leftist parts of his military arm, like got perched. So they couldn't really even fight back either. So this guy at that point fucking just took Nanjing, Shanghai, moved his capital to Nanjing to in to spite Wang Jingwei's um, attempt at moving the capital to uh, Wuhan. And there was kind of a split in the Guomindang right when this purge happened. And event, and it will come back together again, but Wang Jingwei at this point just kinda of loses out on kind of everything. He kinda of, he he kinda of cucks himself out of out of any sort of comeback against uh Chiang Kai shek. And this is gonna be this is gonna reverberate because Wang Jingwei later on will collaborate with the Japanese for uh, and set up a puppet government. And a little bit of it is just kind of this fucking molding against um what Chiang Kai-shek kind of did to him. But Wang Jingwei was kind of a pansy himself, right? He fucking rolled over at the first set, first hint of uh, trouble. Now, this, you know, the Soviet Union is kind of sitting there with their, their dick in their hands, right? They're, they got caught flat out. And they're like, holy fuck, what do we do now, right? Like, you know, the Comintern fucking got boned. The, the, the Chinese communists got boned. The Comintern's kind of looking there with uh, caught with their pants down. But, you know, uh, Stalin was still saying, like, you know, these guys look like they're going to become the leader of China, and I want fucking non-hostile relations with them. And, you know, like, they're holding out hope that Chiang Kai-shek was, uh, was, had, had done some time in the Soviet Union. Hopefully, you know, they can still kind of get him, get him around to, um, being, being on friendly terms. And, uh... I mean, they weren't half wrong. They weren't really wrong. They were they were half right in the Soviet Union because Chiang Kai Shek was still amenable to um, making deals with Stalin. And later on, even when the Chinese Civil War went full blown balls to the wall, Stalin was still kind of more like more than sixty percent supporting the Kuomintang because Chiang Kai Shek agreed to a lot of concessions. And one of the most important ones was. Uh, the Soviet Union needed a warm water port in the Pacific because they got they realized that they're kind of caught in a really bad position because most of their ports, you know, during the winter it's unusable. And this was before, you know, Vladivostok and those areas I think became ports. I I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that shit. <laughs> but they will always want some sort of warm water port in the Pacific that's, you know, that's uh usable all year round. And they had their eyes on what was called Port Arthur at the time that was kind of in the modern day Liaoning province uh, around uh, Da Lian, Lu Shun. That was the Chinese name, right? Lu Shun was the Chinese name. Uh, it's, I think it's just Da Lian now. I feel kind of dumb because I, I can't remember if that is the case or not. I hope I'm right. Anyways, um, but that was Stalin's prize, and that would be the Soviet Union's like main go-to thing. Where it's like, you know what? I want to have good relations with these with these Chinese because you know if if I can get a good relations with Chiang Kai-shek, and if I can negotiate these ports and whatever, fuck it, he can kill all the communists he wants in China as long as I get as long as me Stalin has, gets what I want in uh in, in China these concessions, I'm happy, right? Chiang Kai-shek would. He wouldn't. He's not in control of uh, Manchuria at this time. But when he does, he kind of gives the Russians what they want. So the Russians, you know, they don't. They kind of back off. And this serves as a point of tension later on between Mao Zedong and Stalin because Mao Zedong was like, you know, during our worst time, you guys were still supporting Chiang Kai Shek. Again, getting ahead of myself. So Chiang Kai Shek fucking consolidates power, kills a bunch of communists. And he is having a huge raging boner right now because he's thinking, "Fuck, I'm really close." Like, this is this is uh, my fantasies of of um, establishing a united China, the new dynasty under Chiang Kai Shek to fucking uh, you know make my name in history. Uh, so, and then so consolidates power. He looks towards the north again to try to to um, to fight the warlords 
the the leftovers, you know, the Zhi Li clique that were the the leftovers from uh, Yuan Shikai's Beiyang army. He takes those guys out. If he can get to Beijing and take those guys out, then he's golden, right? He wins it. Um, so yeah, really, those guys. So he s- continues the northern expedition. The groundwork previously from um, the leftists and communists that were now purged, you know, they're still there. They're you know these guys are purged, but the groundwork was still laid, and that the northern expedition would could still continue the way it sort of did before. Um, eventually, he reached a point where the the guys that were in like Manchuria and uh, the the warlord armies that were in Manchuria and Beijing that were fighting the Kuomintang, they get fucking desperate and they start to think, oh fuck, I'm gonna lose. And one of these guys, uh, the warlord of Manchuria, Zhang Zuolin, you know, right now the Japanese uh, have a lot of influence in. Because they have, they have, they've colonized Korea, right? Um, they have a lot of influence in Manchuria as well. And Zhang Zulin was sort of seen as their guy, you know, their fucking more or less puppet. And so was the the the, the guy in uh, Shandong. So when they were, you know, like counting on, uh, when they were just kind of warlords in their own capacity, yeah, they would rely on the Japanese to uh, to prop them up and give them that that boost in their base power well when they started losing they would you know the thought was oh fuck it if you can't beat them join them right so um <laughs> Zhang Zulin was sort of leaning towards hey you know what if I'm gonna if, if the Gomino are gonna fucking like just wreck me um maybe I should start thinking about aligning towards them well the Japanese didn't like this at all right so they just fucking killed him they bombed the train that he was in. Well, they made it look like an accident. And fucking Zhang Zulin was off, right? Like uh, Godfather style. Um, and they and the Japanese thought, hey, yeah, fucking, you know, yeah, you fuck on me. This is what happens, right? So they were hoping that Zhang Zulin's son would be more, would bow down to the Japanese and, you know, there would be none, enough of this talk of, of joining up with the Kuomintang. It did the exact opposite. Zhang Zuolin's son it was a guy named uh, Zhang Xueliang. This guy's... And remember this guy's name because he does something important later on. But Zhang Xueliang was pissed off that the Japanese kind of offed his dad via train bomb. Um, I think it was a train bomb. I don't want to fucking look like a fool if I was wrong. Uh, oh, whatever, whatever, fucking, probably wrong about a lot of this shit that I can't remember, probably. The details, that is, not the main thing. Uh, Zhang Xueliang, pissed off the Japanese, just straight up says, you know what, I'm fucking, I'm putting up the Kuomintang flag, you know, fuck you guys, right? Uh, so it, it backfired on the Japanese pretty hard, and literally kind of just ended the northern expedition that way, because the northern warlords would nominally... Say, you know what? Yeah, let's put up the Kuomintang flag. Yeah, I, you know, let's work together. You know, you you, you can be the the fucking Chiang Kai Shek. You can be the Generalissimo and whatnot. So, nominally, the country was considered kind of unified. In practicality, not really, because these were these areas are still f- uh, fiefdoms of all these warlords, right? They they had a lot of autonomy. Chiang Kai-shek can make requests of them to, you know, send some support or armies and whatnot uh, to, to help. Especially, you'll see this when Chiang Kai-shek starts the big fucking, his big uh, war against the communists. But, um, uh, yeah, the country wasn't really, wasn't meaningfully uh, united. And you'll see that Chiang Kai-shek will do Jiang Jieshu will do these political machinations to kind of pit like warlords uh, against each other. He would play it like he felt he would role play like Cao Cao and try to <laughs> try to like uh, maneuver politically these guys to try to vie for more and more and to just kind of by piecemeal vie for more power and get it right. Jiang Jie at this so. He's riding high on this. Uh, he turns literally all his attention to the communists. Before the, when he did the purge, he probably he killed off most of it. He decimated them, but there was annoyingly there was a little sliver against his ass, which was kind of like the start of the the communist party's red army in these places, right? 
in uh, Jiangxi and 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 especially these the in where Mao Zedong was was this place called uh, Jinggangshan. What Mao kind of did when all when shit hit the fan was he took whatever he kind of joined up with uh, the remnants of the, of communist resistance in these in these areas that were like mountainous and and at least provided them some shelter from like uh, the Guomindang hunt, hunting them down. And then in these areas, uh, they kind of established their own like uh, this communist. Uh, this free communist state, right? So they gathered as much remnants as they can to try to hold off in these areas. And Mao Zedong, um, he was now beginning to put his theory into practice, which was the theory of, you know what, the revolutionary base is going to come from the peasantry. That's where we're going to get our support. That's how we're going to be successful. Right, and he was putting it into practice. He was getting a lot of, uh, a lot of, like prestige, and he's getting a lot of like actually, uh, word of mouth was going around like this guy's giving. You know, he's divvying out land, right? Like you don't have to fucking work as a serf on, on serf peasant on these lands, like paying fucking landlord uh, everything that you're you're harvesting as crop, and you know just being in perpetual servitude. He would come in, fucking take these lands from the landlords, uh, and from what he learned at the Hunan peasant areas, you know, you give these peasants the power, you know, they can they can sort these things out themselves, and they also know who should be punished or the severity of punishments, and um, they also know like how to divvy up the work themselves, and what he he would kind of encourage them to just say like, hey, you know. Um, Give everybody a chance, even if they're landlords, give them a chance to farm. You give them their own plot of land to farm. And if they can farm, great. If they're still kind of trying to sabotage you, then fucking, you know, their punishment must be severe. Right? Uh, And this worked out pretty well for him because he was actually establishing his base at Jiangshan pretty, you know, like it was a pretty solid base. And he had a lot of the, the populace that would buy into this. So, you know, the Gomindang tried to send spies in there to try to get people to snitch on him and try to fucking get, uh, subvert him. It wouldn't work because the people would be more solidly on his side, right? In fact, he would get, uh, the advantage of these, of guys coming in to warn him. The local guys, oh, okay, you know, this is where the, this is where Chiang Kai shek's uh, come to get you, you know. He can get prior advance notice from this network of, of people that would, be a kind of a, that would be on his side. So this whole experiment of basically building a state was being done in these areas. They would, I mean, they would um, basically be in charge of their own production, and so in doing so, they would have their own exchange value on things. They pretty much meant their own currency. They, they you know, um, they had this whole actually uh, social uh, society system kind of getting built up in these areas, and it was a system where like these peasants were. More or less, you know, they they got to farm their own land. They got to do what they wanted, um, instead of working uh, as basically, you know, like indentured <laughs> servants. Um, so again, this is another contrast at this point in time. Chiang Kai Shek is at the top of his 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 game, at the top, of, at the peak of his life, basically. The northern expedition. Just finished with Chiang Kai Shek as nash- no, uh, the notional, uh, nominal national leader, and this is what people kind of refer to as the start of the Nanjing decade. His capital was at Nanjing. This was supposed to be the golden age of his, uh, of his administration of his regime. Right. This is when um, basically peace was kind of restored to the lands and. And they would say, oh, okay, this is what the peak of nationalist development. If you ever look at the numbers of the nineteen decade, it's kind of it's kind of lukewarm because considering that at this point the international recognition they have, you know, the international uh, foreign affairs, the the other countries of the world, they now have like this guy to deal with. Before it was, you know, Yuan Shikai, but then he died. They kind of, you know, like. 
the world doesn't really know who is the, going to be the leader in China. They don't know really who to deal with, who to like keep up their concession, their maintain their concessions in like Shanghai and uh, and and those the concession cities, right? Because if you recall, um, the, for those people that know Chinese history, like at the end of the thing, it was it was just a bunch of it was just fucking a free for all where. All the countries that could take advantage of uh, Qing's uh, fucking decline to set up concessions, basically extra ter- territorial, extra territorial um, areas in, in places like Shanghai, where you know this would be like the British quarter of Shanghai or the French quarter, right, or the Japanese quarter. It would be like their own parcel of land where they set up businesses and and uh, their own slice of China in these areas, right. Which was a major fucking uh, <laughs> trigger point against Chinese people because they felt this was this was bullshit, right? And some of these places it would say have signs where it's like, you know, dogs and Chinese people are not allowed in on the premises, right? So you think, oh fuck, in my own country, yeah, get fucked, right? Um, uh, this this resentment was always going to boil over. But Chiang Kai Shek. He got this recognition, this global recognition. They started piling in, uh, like support, kind of to his government. As long as he can maintain these concessions, they would give him the support. And especially around this time, because he had this falling out, more or less with the Soviet Union, they kind of withdrew their advisors and, and military support. This is when he, <laughs> he, got became much more buddy buddy with Germany, Nazi Germany at this time. And Hitler was very pleased that he purged all these communists. From his organization, before Hitler would kind of, you know, Hitler hates communists as well. And before he was kind of thinking, "Fuck," you know, even in Time Magazine, Chiang Kai Shek was called the Red General. You know, fucking this menace of communism. You know, this is not looking good. But when Chiang Kai Shek purged the communists from his party, Hitler was ecstatic, right? And when Chiang Kai Shek was saying, "Hey, let's establish relations. Can you help me out?" Uh, Hitler's Germany was like, "Fuck yeah." You know, like we'll th- we'll take over where the Soviet Union withdrew from. You know, you want military material done. You want fucking advisors and shit done. And this is the this is the part where you'll see in the old fo- photographs the Kuomintang starts to get outfitted just like the Wehrmacht, right? The German army. You got the the German ha- army helmets and German German um, training the formations, the rifles, uh, uh, the way the Bundeswehr was. Uh, was uh, well, it's not the Bundeswehr yet, it's the Wehrmacht. The way the Wehrmacht was organized, Chiang Kai shek, he begins to organize divisions the same as uh, German divisions, right? His German trained troops, but you know, I and you know, like America, England, France, they're all giving recognition to him. You know, he is the nominal leader, well, he, he is the face of the leadership of China, he is the generalissimo, right? They can deal with him. He keeps everybody's interests maintained. They will give him favorable deals. And the Nanjing decade itself, if you're looking at the, like what production was like, what was life like, and what was um, like generally, what did this, this golden decade look like? And and this question, you know, I realize this question, answering this question has taken like an hour already. But this is fucking, you know, you gotta get thorough on this shit. So I hope you enjoy this, Billy. <laughs> this hour long answer but not even close to done yet by the way Nanjing decade would be what you would look at, look at to see hey what if uh, Chiang Kai-shek was you know leader of China what if you won the civil war and this is what China looked like Nanjing decade is the closest approximation you can get right and from what it seemed like the the trend especially uh, back then from Taiwan and and also <laughs> So, like ridiculously, I don't know why this happens, but I I remember on Fox News, I was I, there was this, like this panel uh, of guests uh, that were on, on this uh, Fox News uh, commentary show. And there was this one guy that was just a fucking diehard fanboy that fucking just got hard just from thinking about Chiang Kai Shek, and he he sat down and the way he introduced himself was like, "Oh yeah, I'm the author of these books." And oh, by the way, I think Chiang Kai Shek is the the real re- leader of China. You know, I feel like he he is the he's the leader of China. He's the real he's the legitimate one. And to get 
sense of how ridiculous it sounds. This was in like the 2000s or it was like 2010 something, right? Fucking Civil War has been over. Chinese Civil War has been over for, well, not really over, but it's been decided, it's been settled. The People's Republic won, right? For fucking... <laughs> <laughs> like 60 plus years at that point you know it's, it's as ridiculous as some foreigner coming to America and then saying well some foreigner going on a show talking about America saying you know what fucking for what it's worth I think Jefferson Davis the president of the confederacy I think he's the real leader of America you know fucking hundreds of years after the conclusion of the civil American civil war just no one asked him this he just says this off the top of his head and this is the kind of, this is the kind of like, the fucking pumping of the stock of the Nanjing decade that some people will get, that some people, especially like this, the more revisionist, sort of outfits like you know American Enterprise Institution, those guys, these you know, Fox News contributors, when they want to talk to some China expert, they get these fucking clowns to go up to say these kind of things, right? Like living in a fantasy world. And the Nanjing decade. F- through them, through some of their like, um, their, their like newly uh, revisited kind of uh, uh, commentary on it, they're like, "Oh, look how great everything was," but the the numbers at the time were pointing at something that was really just fucking lukewarm, right? And and you know, like primary source material, you you can look at even the stuff that was coming out of. Western organizations like charities, um, uh, you know, the news, the charities, even the local Chinese press, even the local Chinese numbers uh, that you can get, the records that you can get, and all the commentary and all the fucking drama that was going on. Nanjing Deku was kind of like a, it, yeah, it's a peaceful time, but the shit show was still kind of going on. And you could see from uh, the American, uh, I think it was John Layton Stewart, or whoever the ambassador was at the time, his. His embassy office was kind of doing uh, kind of a, a survey along with like local uh, like Jesuit missionary uh, organizations that were doing relief famine uh, famine relief work at the time. They were overwhelmed and they were estimating at that time just in the the Nanjing like the Guomindang core areas around Jiangnan, which was the rich part, and also a little bit in the interior. You know, like fucking nine million people were nine million peasants were dying of starvation just in that area, the relatively fertile area, a year, and this was during you know the fucking golden year decades. Shanghai alone, when you look at it, it was uh, that one city had over half of the entire power generation for the entire country, so Shanghai was more than 50% of everything that was going on um, production-wise was in kind of in Shanghai. And Shanghai, before liberation, and especially during these times, and before the Japanese war, uh, the war against Japan, during this peaceful golden age of the Republic of China times, um, they had people that would be uh, collecting, they had people that would be collecting human garbage. So that would be like, Every night, they would have these guys that were in rickshaws that go out to collect uh, specifically human garbage, basically dead bodies on the streets, right? People that didn't survive the night. And then there was, there was like this whole um, profession that was going around in, in Shanghai. You know, they get, they get, they paid these guys by the hour to go, you know, at night, along with the other whatever sanitation workers, pick up corpses of people that have just fucking died died off the homeless that died off in the street in Shanghai right and if you think about it, this city was generated more than 50% of the power output of of China at that time this most the most developed city China had to offer and this was the state of it right the the most the most developed parts would be near the Bund, where uh, right now you can see the old colonial buildings. Right, this is where the con- the foreign concessions were. This is where like the the casinos were. This is where the hotels were. This is where all the all the who's who of the expats in Shanghai they all hung out there. Right, and then um, you know you, you you get the local people just working in the service capacity to all these people. And then just outside of the Bund, in the rest of the city, you know, you got people fucking poor. Like the slums of Mumbai, right? But 
you know, <laughs> on on steroids, uh, just because of the fucking just the the disregard for uh, basically life at that time. And I've, it, it was a holdover from the old dynastic China times where. Throughout history, whenever there was like big famines that occurred, and it was quite often, each in each dynasty, the historian would just write like one line. That was all they allocated towards um, writing about that, about disasters. And usually, it would be something called like it would be something going along the lines of "ren xiang shi," which means people have become food. The implication, what that means, and what the what they record down in the history is. The implications are not even it's not even famine it's for for it to get noticed in the in in old in ancient china or old dynastic china was if it got if it if the famine or a, a food shortage became so bad that people resorted to cannibalism and that's when they would be afforded one line of observation in the history and uh, in the official history books where it's like you know fucking the tenth year of whatever Tianbao emperor of whatever dynasty, well Tianbao would be Tang dynasty, but um, you know in whatever province prefecture people have become food. That's what it means, and <clears throat> this is the ever pervasive uh, reality in in China at that time from the Republic and before, from like Chiang Kai Shek's Republic of China and before. That during peacetime you would get, a, you would get times where famine would be prevalent, and and you know like normal famine wouldn't even register, and they would only take notice if oh it got so bad that you know, uh, parents were selling kids or fucking even fa- uh, farmers were eat the kids that didn't survive, stuff like that right like eat the corpses of people that passed away and couldn't survive, um, and this was. You know, when people think of uh, you know like the good parts of like dynastic China, where you know you can see the Forbidden City, you, you know how it's the the grand magnificence, the splendor of it, the splendor of all the like the famous poets of the Tang Dynasty, of how uh, how prosperous these Golden Age emperors were. Yeah, you have that, but on the same side, you have. Just un, just suffering from the majority of people. Just a shit life, right? Life expectancy, even going into Republic of China time, Nanjing decade, was on average thirty, some years old. So, like that is the fucking the golden age of the Republic of China for you know everybody. Life expectancy was about thirty something odd years. It got bumped up a couple of years during the Nanjing decade, but that was still within 30s, right? The deaths per, thou- per thousand numbers was basically just fucking, you might as well just have fucking World War II going on in your country, right? It was it was pretty bad. And if you look at the numbers, that what the, you know, the increase, they had a percentage increase in manufacturing in certain goods, right? Um, they like to point to these numbers, and you know you can see, yeah, oh yeah, definitely from the time of when Chiang Kai Shek was was when when the Republic of China was just in you know like <laughs> fucking Guangdong and stuff, and they had to fight warlords. Yeah, production of of common goods was going up, and this was you know like textiles or whatnot, especially a lot of it centered in Shanghai and Nanjing and the coastal areas, right? And then. But the foreign firms were the ones that were producing cars and stuff and whatnot, right? Republic of China had a big problem in manufacturing itself. Like, you'll see this come to prominence during the War of Japan where it just, fuck, like, even producing the Chiang Kai-shek rifle was kind of a challenge for the Republic of China. And and this was before they had to move their industries inland towards Chongqing, Chongqing during their retreat when the Japan was invading like this it, it was all haphazard shit like it was really poor efficiency poor numbers uh they they tried like they really tried they got as much as they could, could 
to industrialists to try to fucking industrialize this country. But it's not until the People's Republic of China is actually established that the country actually does begin to industrialize. And that will, will, and maybe even if that doesn't get covered today in this episode, maybe in the future I'll talk about all that shit. That even during like, even during like the mishap years, like the 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 sh- shit hit the fan years during the Great Leap Forward, or um. Uh, in, during in the cities during the Cultural Revolution, like fucking that country was getting developed, and the development was at a much higher level and a much better pace and much higher pace than the Nanjing decade. The infl- so the worst years of the People's Republic of China was either on par or already better than the best years of the Republic of China during this time, and you know like. It's in the fucking the ingredients of what makes up the difference of these two uh, governments, because Chiang Kai-shek, his view of it was basically like you know, like China, the the force of China will come from its elite. The elite will be the people that drive it. They're the people that matter, right? Any kind of a state assistance and whatnot will have to go to the elite because that's what the philosophy of the of the Kuomintang was. After the left purge from the party, everything was concentrated in, in where it's like, the country will only get rebuilt if we cultivate the elites, right? If we give them what they need to build, rebuild the country. And then you can, I'll, we'll probably get to later on how this kind of, <laughs> like, uh, fucking spectacularly failed in the face of it when, you know, Chiang Kai-shek's own family was kind of embezzling money during the war effort, you know, like ha- almost a substantial amount of of war assistance in the billions was getting, not even by their own family, but everybody in power, the Minister of Finance, Ministers of War and whatnot, Ministers of Education, like everybody was in on the take, fucking... You remember the guy I was talking about before, Kong, Kong Xiangxi, uh, the the husband of uh, Song Ailing, fuck that guy, like that family it was one of the ones that got even more richer during the war with Japan. Um, as opposed to the People's Republic of China, the philosophy was, you know, the base people, the, the masses were going to build the country, right? Uh, rebuild the country. So that was the peasantry, that was the, you know, uh, the proles, the workers in in the urban areas, that was the petite bourgeois in um, and also even they considered the national bourgeois and these were the classes that were going to rebuild the country, so the entire philosophy, the entire um, style of what, the philosophy of ruling the country um, you can see that there was a, a big market difference in what what resources were concentrated, what the attitudes were. Um, Chiang Kai-shek, for the most part, when he regarded the peasants, he kind of regarded them as like, like I said, he was more or less in the form of the old dynastic um, sort of uh, figures, uh, leaders and and um, noble uh, noblemen, I guess, <laughs> military leaders, emperors, uh, dukes and whatnot, where in the old Confucian sort of uh, outlook, it's like you have these classes of people, and peasants are supposed to be respected because they produce the food for everybody, right? But in this, in the contradictory way Confucian for Confucianism uh, exists, they are important, but they have to know their place, and that was the same. That was the philosophy that Chiang Kai-shek sort of took as well. Like, yes, peasants, you know, they're the fucking, the old heart, the old uh, perpetual heart of China. But the country itself, you know, like, the role of the peasant must be subservient to the elite, Confucian, ideal, moral rulers and the, the classes in society that are their overlords. You know, like, if everyone gets along in these defined class roles these Confucian rules, everything will be fine. But it depends on the peasants getting with the program. So if there's a peasant rebellion, you got to put it down, right? Because that's them overstepping their roles. 
and the leadership has to be, you know, in Confucian terms, it, should, it has to be moral to s- set this upright um, uh, example and justification to rule, right? But for, you know, like, but th- that was it. They're, the peasants could not fucking tell the leaders what to do or enforce their will on leaders. You know, it's kind of like how Americans view like uh, Mexican labor right now, right? Uh, uh, illegal immigrant labor where it's like they they view it as necess- it's a necessity especially during like harvest time they need these these hands to work the farms and whatnot but it's just like that's it they they don't view them as very much uh as equals of themselves as you know american citizens citizens and whatnot uh high class in china was viewed that as that way as well like the peasants literally because of the food production they are the entire heart of of society and it's it's underpinning the economic underpinnings can't have a society without food production can't have civilization without food production they recognize that fact confucianism recognize that fact but they're limited and only that's all they can ever be that's their station in life they're respected because they do food you know like they 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 produce the food but they don't deserve the same respect as the fucking the scholar that knows all the classics they don't deserve the same respect as you know these families that own the land and what and not um and that's kind of how it is too that that's how it that's how Chiang Kai-shek built, viewed his hierarchy and his version of like what the new Chinese uh, uh, moral guidelines should be he came out with he one of his most proud achievements was uh saying that oh I came out with the I promoted this the new life movement, right? Xin Sheng Huo Yun Dong, which was basically his his attempt at this new neo Confucius uh fucking thought I guess philosophy that China should adhere to. And it was mostly like, oh people should be upright. You know, if you're a peasant you should fucking be upright and this is how you should be the upright, moral, just Confucian character. You know what? If you need to starve for the country, consider it like an honor. And a, a sacred honor that you should sacrifice uh, your your life for the image and the prestige of this of the country, and you know like find something better in your material life. You know like if your children starve, ah whatever. You know like as long as it's good for the country, you will be martyred, right? Um, and also you know fucking like dress nicely, please, uh, and be be much more civil. You know fucking be nice to clean yourselves up. During a time where, during a famine, you know, like, fucking, you'd be reduced to eating your own family, he was coming out with his edicts that would say, you know, like, hey, fucking brush your hair and shit, alright, <laughs> fucking clean yourself up. So, on the, what it means is basically he's, he's in it for this, 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 this image of China, of what he perceives as the perfect China, as an image. The material realities of most of the people that are suffering it's it's secondary to what they need to contribute to these this uh image this uh culture this refinement of the country he viewed it as kind of like we're in this we're in this problem right now because of uh, moral decay you know it's not really based on a, like an objective analysis of just material just complete lack of material anything but it's mostly like, you know, fucking, if you pull yourselves up by your own bootlaces, you know, morally, you know, fucking clean yourselves up, uh, clean your room and all that jazz, this, you, you know, then, then, you know, everything will be better. Forget that, you know, you know, we've gone through all these internecine wars of warlords and, and, and shit, and then later on the Japanese coming in to invade. You know, everybody should practice these moral virtues <laughs> instead of fucking trying to survive. And no joke, uh, he was <laughs> he was kind of fucking uh, trolled and criticized internally and externally. Like within the country, people came out with articles and being like, "What the fuck is this shit?" Especially during when J- Japan was invading, he is, he he upped the anti of the new life movement, his new life movement, saying. While, you know, fucking people were getting raped and killed by the Japanese, he would tell the people, you know, like, fuck, you know, 
that's besides the point. You guys gotta fucking clean up your act. You guys gotta fucking clean yourselves up and clean up your moral image and of uh, you know. And then the outside press was like, uh, "This is kind of weird. Why would you know? You you gotta get your priorities straight." The internal press and the internal, um, even the literati at the time were like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" And he, um, to implement sort of this. The closest thing that you can get in the modern world, uh, well, you know, a really good analogy would be like the the morality police in Saudi Arabia, where they go around to make sure that um, that you know women are veiled up and doing what they need to do in that in a Sharia law society. Well, he came up with his own like morality enforcers. They were in English, they're called like the blue shirts, right? And they were started by one of his loyal guys that were um, that wanted to model this organization, the blue shirts, on Mussolini's black shirts. That's fucking where the shirt, the whole fucking shirt thing comes in, right? The entire Chinese name, I think, was called something like San Min Zhu Yi Li Xing She. Something like, you know, the three principles of the people... Um, and just strength, fucking whatever society. Uh, okay, well, spirit encouragement society, I guess. What? Li uh, I I guess so. There's a lot of different names for it. Zhonghua Fu Xing She. Also, China Reconstruction Society. These guys, they were his morality police. Lan Yi She. That's what. That's the direct translation from the Blue Shirt Society. This was his morality police. This was his version of the Saudi morality police going around telling you know women and whatnot to dress up and for people to, uh, to go to answer prayer and whatnot. These were these were the guys going around you know going to households and going to peasants, going and then also using violence against people that they perceived to be you know first of all communist leftists, but also people that were <coughs> used it as. Enforcing this kind of new culture, new uh, morality, kind of thought uh, regime, uh, but also as his own goon squad to kind of like the Green Gang from uh, the 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 mob uh, gangsters that he used for in Shanghai from with his buddy uh, Du Yuesheng to kind of purge communists. This was his goon squad to kind of go around and enforce. Uh, things to his, to kind of his liking, to what, what he felt was society should look like. Notice, if you notice, this was like what he viewed as development, as the high point of as, during the peaceful eras of the Nanjing decade, right? There was no it's less material improvement, less like uh, trying to improve the life and even just to give. Um, the majority of peasants, uh, something, a semblance of like some kind of new ushering into the the new world, instead of living in the old Qing Dynasty arrangements of you know farming for a fucking plot of land for the landlord and the local uh, officials, and the this was what the Nanjing Decade was kind of like. It was it was the it was gilded. It was China's. Uh, version of the Gilded Age. Everything was gold, fucking plastering on the outside to make it look shiny, especially in places as, like Shanghai or Nanjing. But the inside of it all is it still the same rot. It was still the same rot that was uh, that was there from the Qing Dynasty, and it just carried on. And he couldn't do anything about that too, even if, and he didn't want to, because that was where his power base was, his support. Like I said, was the landlord's support, you know. Kuomintang, especially after the purge, was seen as like the landlord party, and during the, when the communists would take over an area, you know, fucking it was the Kuomintang that would do the counterattack. They would get if the landlords fled, um, they would they would uh, fucking get they would come back with the Kuomintang army when they retook the village back from the peasants, you know, they would. They would go back and do uh, retribution and reprisals, and these guys, these specific guys that would that landlords displaced landlords that would come back to take revenge on on peasant liberated areas. They were called the Huan Xiang Dui, Hai Xiang Dui. 
if I remember correctly. And, you know, these guys are fucking notorious because they have to set an example. Whereas, like, you dare to you fucking rise up against me and take my holdings, I'll show you what's what. Say so they'll do stuff like fucking murdering the families and all that. All that jazz. Anybody that was... If the peasants were tried to put up a stand and they lost and they were left behind, you know, fucking, you're good as dead. And... And... So let's just get into this. At this time, fully... Full on fucking balls to the wall against the communists, right? And <laughs> it was it was during this time that you know fucking um, the Mao Zedong and his communists, uh, his fellow communists were at like were in the pits. They were hitting a rock bottom. They were getting surrounded by the nationalists, and uh, one by one in these areas, they were just getting wrecked. One of the areas that was withstood it was Mao Zedong's area, but you know eventually, you know the the communists that got wrecked from these other areas would would start to uh, uh, group up and come to the these areas that were that were still away from Guomindang control, but um, uh, the Guomindang with their new like German uh, advisors on how to conduct this war. To try to eliminate these last communist areas, they, you know, in the beginning, when they're trying to dislodge Mao Zedong's forces from uh, Jiangxi, they would fail, right? Because Mao's uh, army would kind of beat them back. Um, but the German advisors gave uh, this tactical advice to try to advance slowly, use your superior numbers, advance slowly, build up blockhouses, right? So even, like, the local peasantry that were trying to help them, they would get, they wouldn't be able to help because it would separate them from the uh, the communists. They would try to starve them out, choke them off in this way. Um, and it, this is a lot of brutal back and forth, too, right? Like, previously to this, after the after the Gomingdong purge, when communists were fucking, it was open season on communists, um, you know, Chiang Kai-shek, he would send guys, he would send, he he would get, like, these guys to hunt down their families and stuff, too. Like, uh, Mao Zedong had to leave behind his his wife at the time. Uh, you remember, he was, uh, I told, I said before, he married the daughter of uh, Yang Changji, uh, which was a prominent intellectual during, you know, his time at Beijing or whatever. He married her, his daughter Yang Kai Hui, and um, by all accounts, I think he was Mao got married multiple times afterwards. Uh, especially living the life as like this fucking on the road revolutionary, you know, <laughs> you don't really get to settle down for a family at a time. And Yang Kai Hui, I think, was his like I guess his first love or whatnot, right? Like he had a lot of the probably the most affection for her. Um. Yeah, like she she had to be left behind in Hunan because she was raising a son, right? He was off to do revolution and shit. He was raising a son in Hunan. Uh, Chiang Kai shek sent uh, this guy, this Guomindang uh, warlord, He Jian, to go and hunt down uh, uh, fucking his family and stuff. So what happened was He Jian um, captured Mao Zedong's wife and then forced her to basically recant him, to basically say, you know, Mao Zedong is a piece of shit in, in public record. She refused to do that in public, and she she refused to renounce him, so he executed her. And I think he did this in front of uh, her son, well, Mao's son, is his oldest son, uh, Mao Anying. And Mao Anying would later grow up um, and, you know, like... He would later grow up to fight in the Korean War, and he would die in the Korean War too. So, lots of family fucking did not enjoy uh, living a peaceful life. If you were a communist revolutionary, uh, Zhu De's wife, um, fucking who was it at the time? She got executed, but she got like decapitated, and her head was put on a stake in front of, in front of like the town to make an example out of. It was. It was still this mindset of like Qing Dynasty, like punishment for these people that dare to, fucking, to have some kind, dare to oppose the government, right? And these were you know Guomindang generals, but set in the, still very much set in the old ways, encouraged, from you know like, 
their positions in power and their view of themselves in, in as in their role in Chinese in their Chinese history, right? Um. So I mean, like, if you're a communist, your your best bet was probably not to surrender to the, the Kuomintang, right? Like, uh, you if you're lucky, you get off fine, right? You, you, if you're a nobody. Yeah, you you might you might survive, but if you're somebody, if you're just anybody, you're fucking you might be done if you if if you were gonna get captured, right? So even facing down this uh, encirclement of the Kuomintang, and this was it was multiple encirclements because they failed a couple times, but it was at this time that the Comintern still uh, uh the the Comintern leaders of of the communist party which were still more or less they felt like they were still ca- calling the shots um these two guys this one guy that was sent from moscow he was a german guy otto braun who was supposed to be the the tactician guy for the communist the chinese communist party and then another guy that was f- sent from moscow uh common turn guy uh bogu he these guys were kind of like calling the shots when they got there, and it's kind of like the the situation where you're you know you're holding down the fort, and then these fucking guys from out of town they show up and they're like, all right, we're in charge now, and this is what we should do, <laughs> right? They they make a whole shit show of the whole thing. They basically almost get wrecked, and then they're forced to flee from the the Jiangxi area that Mao Zedong kind of built up to flee, and at uh, this was the beginning of the lowest point that the Communist Party can get to. Just when they thought, you know, fucking, you couldn't get worse than this. Nope. This is when they have to flee, and this was when the start of, like, the Long March sort of happened. And it was at this time that, you know, Mao Zedong, if you recall, he went from the fucking... He came in at the state of the low-grunt worker, right? The low-grunt party member, activist, um, slash reporter, slash... Library, former library assistant, working his way up. Um, people like Zhou Enlai, who was had quite a bit amount of prestige and rank in in the party. Um, Zhu De, who was by himself, uh, by all rights, uh, uh, an art like a general with his own army and and stuff. They would fucking, they would propel, they would vouch for Mao. Like, yeah, you know what? Let's listen to this guy. He. More or less, he knows what he's doing. They would vouch for him at the uh, at when the Communist Party they kind of got together. They're like, "Okay, this shit's not working. The common turns screwing us up. Otto Braun's a piece of shit. He doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. Bogu, he's basically an ass licker. Like we're we're facing like fuck. We're gonna be done if we just keep on following these like nobodies, these blowhards from Moscow, right?" So these, these guys came out with saying, "You know what? Let's follow Mao Zedong. Like let's. This guy's been proved right." Proved right so far. He fucking he's been through trial by fire, like and John Lai Chuda, those guys outrank him, but they're like, you know what? Let's make him the leader. So this was at the Tsun Yi conference during their long retreat. There he decided Mao Zedong should be fucking leader and to sideline the common turn Moscow guys. Um, and then Mao Zedong's plan was, you know, we gotta take the long route, like the in the most difficult terrain to to actually have a chance to escape the pursuing Guomingdong forces. You gotta go through all the way west, through Sichuan, even parts of Yunnan. You have to go off through like Tibet and well Qinghai, like really mountainous, unforgiving terrain, all the way up to what may be the last remnants of a communist friendly stronghold area in Shanxi and Yan Yan. And Anybody's looking at this like, holy shit, man! Like, fuck, this is going to be impossible. But they did it. They that's what they decided. It's like fucking do or die. So this is what everybody's saying. What's now famously known as the Long March, right? And you know, it gets to a point where if you're fucking, if you hate the communists, if you hate Mao Zedong so much, you know, like you'd want to, you'd be a person like. Jung Chang that comes out with these revisionist books and saying, yeah, this wasn't such a big deal. Fucking, they, even the Guomindang helped them to fucking, they wanted them to do the long march. See, it was the Guomindang's like master plan to keep them fucking unscathed on this long march the whole time. 
which is just on his face, complete bullshit, right? Out of like the 80,000 people that left Jiangxi to go on this march, the only 8,000 made it to Yan at the end. Right, that's that. The attrition rate is fucking horrendous, right? You know, you, this is not a fucking, this is not the, the fucking easy cakewalk that he, anyone's trying to portray it to be, and a lot of it is just attrition, right? Like eighty thousand people start off, and then a lot of them are just like, you know what, fuck this. Like, what's the point? I, I'm not gonna die for this, or I'm this is too much, or fucking whatever, or people just straight up die on the march, right? But like, who's gonna hold you to the, the discipline? Right, if you're gonna slip out in the night, who's gonna hold you? Who's gonna right? There's no way to keep it. They're basically a ragtag group of people themselves. You know, they can barely keep themselves together. Fucking attrition was just that high. If people had enough and they wanted to leave, they fucking didn't leave. What what else can they do? Right? And they maybe they'll say, "Oh, I'll take my chances with the Kuomintang and fucking hopefully they'll let me live," or they flee and fucking change the names or whatever and settle in some other village along the way so from 80,000 you fucking lost like what, what is the percentage of that right like eight, down to 8,000 that, that, that is like 90% fucking gone right so the lowest point of fucking Mao Zedong's life or career I guess highest point of Chiang Kai-shek's career pursuing these communists having the fucking the stranglehold of power of leader of the country they fucking make it. It's it's pretty much a miracle that they made it, but they made it over there. And then this is when a lot of a lot of like shit get, always gets interesting. They make it to Yan, and then the local warlords were kind of like, you know, they Chiang Kai Shek gave them orders to fucking uh, wipe them out as well. But throughout the long march, they, the the communists kind of gained a reputation where it's like you don't want to. They're not an easy prey to kill. They're they're not gonna fucking bend over and lie down. So the warlord armies along the way when they were getting towards from Jiangxi going west and cutting northwest into the the Qinghai plateau and mountains and then making it further northeast into Yan'an itself, which is unforgivable terrain. Marshes, mountains, even desert, you you gotta go through all that. Warlord they were they were beating warlord armies back the entire way, fucking while getting pursued by Kuomintang forces, right? Um, there was that, one of the things that got even, um, one of their events that got, like, mythologized to, uh, to, like, fucking legendary status was they had to cross a bridge where the bridge was out. There was no fucking planks to, on the bridge. It was just chains going from one bank to the other, and they crossed it. They fucking crossed it under fire the whole time, too, right? So the warlord armies were kind of thinking, you know, this is not worth it. You know, like Chiang Kai-shek, he kind of just wants us to do his dirty work for him. We're going to be the one wasting men, material, ammo, and all this stuff to take care of this problem from him. And plus, these guys are a ragtag group anyways, right? Fucking, why would you want to provoke like a wounded badger or whatever? Just let These guys are traveling through the area. They're not gonna even going to stay. Just let them through. Well, not like, let him. Not exactly let him through. You gotta put up the. You gotta put up a fight so old Chan, old Jiang won't like get on your ass about it. But fucking, we're not gonna. <coughs> these guys are not easy to kill. So fucking, what the, you go into battle, you you might come out of it more scarred than they will. So fucking, like, don't f- f- commit. Don't throw everything in the kitchen sink. If you can fight them as a warlord army, fucking fight them. If it's, but if it turns out to be too tough, fucking, you know, and you lose it, just count your wounds you know lick your wounds and fucking and just let it be for the day and this they made it to Yan and Yan um at at Chiang Kai-shek wanted the the warlords there to kind of take care of this problem as well so those guys neighboring province was Shanxi and that was Yanxi Shan's territory and around Yan'an itself was the now displaced Zhang Xueliang so now we gotta explain wh- what's going on here, and this is, and this is gonna make Chiang Kai Shek look like a fucking fool at this point. But we gotta explain what's going on here because this is when our old friend Zhang Xieliang comes back into the picture. Zhang Xieliang was the, if you recall, warlord of Manchuria, and he was he became more the leader of Manchuria after his father was blown to bits by the Japanese, right? Zhang Zulin. Zhang Xieliang 
<clears throat> had probably one of the most well-armed warlord armies at the time. Um, even you, you could say they were almost by himself. He was almost on par with uh, Chiang Kai-shek's army, just by the amount of material. Because Manchuria, Zhang Zolin and Zhang Xieliang's uh, Manchuria was probably the most, and this is northeast China, um, in the current Dongbei provinces like Liaoning, uh, Heilongjiang, uh, Jilin. Um, these, this was the most developed area because just is of its location. The Russians were getting in on it. They built a lot of railroads going from their Port Arthur and shit. And after that, the Japanese came in and and started building their shit around there too, right? So there's a lot of development and building up of infrastructure from these two foreign powers at the time. And Zhang Xiaodong benefited from this, right? Because he could take advantage of this and and trade fucking the local commodities. Like lots of soybean production, lots of trade uh, will actually gave him a lot of money that he can use in his coffers to fund his, uh, his warlord army. Well, it was during this time, it was like 1932, uh, the fucking... The Japanese made their move, right? They did. They orchestrated the the Mukden incident. Mukden is present day Shenyang, uh, where they finally did this. They did this false flag sort of deal to try to agitate hostilities between the Japanese and the Chinese, right? And fucking, they they pushed it. And maybe one of these days we can talk about how the the Japanese were just batshit crazy to the point where military leaders would overrule, uh, like leaders from uh, orders from like Tokyo. To get this done, and they would be rewarded for it too, just because of this fucked up Japanese like um, Im- imperial army and imperial navy culture, where it's like rewarding boldness and fucking action uh, in 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 military uh, action over even just uh, authority over even a civilian authority. But they did this false flag. They fucking opened up hostilities. It was almost close to war. And Zhang Xiaoliang wanted to fight the Japanese. But, you know, he himself was kind of like, fuck, he was kind of fucking around. And Chiang Kai-shek didn't give us blessing. Chiang Kai-shek said, no, just fucking let the Japanese, just let the Japanese take whatever they need and, and, like, and pacify them. You know, like, let them take what they need and, you know, let's not cause trouble for the Japanese. Chiang Kai-shek's <coughs> whole thing was... Japanese are <laughs> are this other problem. Our main problem will always be communists. Let's get rid of the communists first. Uh, and uh, this fam- this uh, his saying, this infamous saying, got immortalized, uh, uh, especially even when Japan started war. And this was one of the things that kind of is is a big black mark on Chiang Kai Shek's name, among others. Where when he said uh, wrong, why be xian an ne, which was we can't to to do anything about the external aggression. We first gotta fucking deal with our deal with our internal shit first. Which you know to people it was saying I'd rather fight the Jap- I'd rather fight the communists rather than these Japanese. And and Zhang Xueliang just got fucking rolled. He had to retreat everything. Right? He couldn't even put up a fight because Chiang Kai Shek didn't want it. And fucking you know like he, he was. He had the best equipped army, and yet it was just all for naught. So Manchuria got ceded to the Japanese. The Japanese came in, took, took, took it, and Chiang Kai-shek was like, "You know what? Fucking just let let them take it. We can't worry about the Japanese right now, right? We gotta worry about the communists." Manchuria was basically taken over by Japanese. Jiang Xilong got fucking kicked out of Manchuria, and this is where he kind of ends up in around the Shanxi area where the communists. Uh, uh, Go to where Yan is in Shanxi, right? The southern ha- tip of the the southern side of the province. So Zhang Xilong at this point is kind of fucking jaded. He's feeling like, what the fuck, right? Like, like this is not who we should be fighting. I'd much rather fight the Japanese. Chiang Kai Shek on the other hand was giving fucking orders so Yan Xishan and you know Zhang Xilong these guys like fuck you know wipe them out, fight these communists. And to their credit, they tried. Like Yan Xishan and, and uh, Zhang Xilong, they tried to to fight them, but they couldn't. The, once the communists got somewhere, you know, just because of who they are and what the what they were, what programs they were like, fucking offering to the peasants in the area, 
these guys were a hit. Like the peasants by now, Mao Zedong had serious street cred because they would hear about what he did in in the in Jiangxi and then what he what the party was doing for for peasants, right? Like fucking redistributing land. It's a big deal. Um, and he got a lot. Of, he got a lot of support wherever he went from for that. And one of the reasons they could even survive in a long march was because the local populace would always help them, would, would lend them the hand when they needed to. And they end up in Shanxi. They end up in Yan, and where you know, like this, I guess a small communist stronghold would be. And they grew it. They land in this area with like eight thousand ish people and their families that came along for the, for the fucking trek. And it just grew. People started flocking to Yan, right? Even like intellectuals, you know, you know, people of note, even nobodies that were just displaced by all this famine or either war or just, you know, they were going to do Yan to fucking because they felt like it was it, they they saw a light with these guys, right? These guys were getting stuff done. Um, so Yan Xishan and. Uh, and Zhang Xilong, even when they were kind of trying to attack, they couldn't. They couldn't win. They were actually beaten back the times where they were going to attack. So, like I said, you know, fucking, why waste? In their minds, they're like, why waste my own men and my own material to fight these guys, which are fucking hard to fight too. And you know, like if we're not exactly winning fans over with the local population by fighting with these guys for Chiang Kai Shek. You know, this asshole sitting in Nanjing looking all pretty while we gotta do his dirty work and we're getting shit on for it. You know, fu- you know, kind of, you know what? Fuck it. Especially Zhang Xilong, he was like, fuck it. Like, I've, he had enough of that shit. So, Chiang Kai-shek was getting frustrated in um, Nanjing where he's like, you know, these guys are not fighting these communists real well. Why are these communists still alive in this area? So he fucking flew. He took a plane. He flew all the way to uh, Xi'an. Which is the the provincial capital of Shanxi, flew to Xi'an, and this is what will be known as the Xi'an incident. And when these th- when I say these famous incidents, usually it means there's a Wikipedia page made for these because they're bi- a big enough deal. What happened was he came to Xi'an, and Zhang Xianliang just straight up kidnapped him, and by gunpoint, and held him hostage, and it was basically saying, "Yo." Um, enough of this bullshit fighting the communists and you know fucking let's I want you to promise that you will fight the Japanese like it's time to fucking uh, do the second united front and fight the Japanese for reference first united front was when the communists and the Kuomintang were or uh, uh, collaborating and were part of the same party before the purge that was the first united front what they were advocating now was the second united front to fight the Japanese Right, and Chiang Kai Shek was not very pleased, and um, and there was probably there was talks in Nanjing where it's like, oh fuck, maybe we should send an army to the rescue him or whatnot. But uh, in the end, they didn't need to because Chiang Kai Shek, you know, either he caved into the pressure from the communists and Zhang Xiaoyang to fight to find to finally begin to actually confront the Japanese. It took the uh, fucking warlord to kidnap him. In order for him to fucking change his mind of fighting other Chinese people to actually start to confront the Japanese, right? Um, so they let him go, but <laughs> this was the kind of ballsy part. Zhang Xiaoliang and another guy uh, offered to, you know, as part of the deal, they would fly with Chiang Kai shek back to uh, Nanjing as now as the reverse hostage, right? So fucking kudos to Zhang Xianliang. He was a warlord. He, and he, you know, he had enough men. Even though he was defeated, he was displaced. He was a commander. He was a warlord in his own right. He gave that shit basically up to become the, the Chiang Kai-shek's hostage as a guarantee when he, when he released uh, Chiang Kai-shek to go back to Nanjing. Him and this other guy. The other guy was not so lucky. The other guy, as soon as they landed in Nanjing, he got imprisoned and he got executed. <laughs> but Zhang Xiaoyang didn't because fucking they would have probably caused an uproar if Chiang Kai-shek killed him. And 
And so the second United Front started. And Zhang Xieliang, for the rest of his life, he was basically just going to be a prisoner of Chiang, Chiang Kai-shek. Even when the communists won, Chiang Kai-shek evacuated Zhang Xieliang to like Taiwan and shit and had him under house arrest and whatnot. And, he, and later on, he released him when he was when Zhang Xieliang was getting older, and I think he lived out the rest of his life in Hawaii, right? He he was like, I refuse to take part in this bullshit between ROC and PRC, right? Fucking lived out the rest of his life in Hawaii. Um, but yeah, like, f- like it took that to get Chiang Kai-shek to actually begin to fight, to confront the Japanese. And <coughs> for his part, Mao Zedong, he was he was in he was all in on it. Like at that point, you can see these old pictures of the communists when he would make these uh, rallies and assemblies in Yan'an, where after the Second United Front became a thing, he would put pictures of he would put this big portrait of Chiang Kai-shek behind him as he's making a speech. Right? If you think about like fucking who would not many people you know would put their arch rivals their like civil war enemies. As like yeah, you know what? This is the we gotta stay true to the Second United Front. This is the leader of all of us right now in our confrontation with the Japanese, right? Uh, but they were not really under any illusions. The communists knew that fucking the nationalists will fucking jump at the chance to kill them if they can, and this happened during the Japanese War too, where they would fight the communists as well. But they were they would have to commit wholeheartedly to this and. This was one of the strengths, especially a huge amount of uh, public uh, public like reputation. Because at that time, you can read a lot of the um, the memoirs of a lot of these people, or even like the, the the newspapers, the press headings at the time, where literally the population of China kind of viewed the communists as the only power, the only group that was really really saying stuff like resisting the Japanese like they were the first movers on this and that gave them a lot of political capital and a lot of prestige and especially during the long march where Mao Zedong was basically had to come to the decision to fucking push artillery pieces off off the mountain just so they can move faster again away from the Guomingdang you know where whereas Chiang Kai-shek can sign his name on a piece of paper mobilize 10,000 troops to kind of fucking sur- kind of surround him on the flanks right the disparity between power was so large yet Mao Zedong had this r- fucking this street cred with the with the rest of the population where even when he was pushing artillery pieces off the mountain and shit and his numbers were dueling down to 8,000 he was saying no we have I have confidence in in this victory that we're going to achieve, and this is how we're going to achieve the victory. This is what we're going to do, and this is how it's going to work. And to his credit, it was working. He, they reached Yan'an. It worked. And he said, we've got, we got to build up the base area in Yan'an. Fucking built it up. Yan Xishan, Chiang Xieliang couldn't fucking dislodge him. Chiang Kai-shek went to the point where Chiang, they'd rather kidnap Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Xieliang would rather kidnap Chiang Kai-shek than fucking... <laughs> Then even attempt to try to fucking uh, uh, destroy the communists in that area, and going into the war against Japan, which would fully erupt like a year later. When Xi'an incident was nineteen thirty six, one year later the Japanese would go full all out war. Right in thirty seven, um, during the war, you know, like Chiang Kai Shek put some of his tried to make a stand in Shanghai to get noticed by senpai which is like the the foreign powers in shanghai right like the british the americans to try to get them to see uh to come on the side of china they got kind of fucking wiped you know all these the all these like well-trained men that (coughs) i had the best esprit de corps and um you know fucking brave motherfuckers they all got sacrificed just for chiang kai-shek's kind of shit show to try to make something out of it and throughout the rest of the war, he would kind of just be retreating and saving up uh, forces, men and material for a, a showdown with the communists. And the communists, on the other hand, they fucking got they got with their fucking expanded power during the war. Because 
what they they were basically the only power that would be behind enemy lines in especially northern China, you know, those provinces that were occupied like Shandong, Manchuria, uh, Beijing, and all those areas, right? <coughs> For people in the area, like the Kuomintang government, the national government was just not there anymore. Like they were left on their own, except the communists were still there. So like this was the only other like like uh, institution or even institution or group that they could rely on. So the communists built it up these base areas very successfully within occupied territory as probably the only like, organizational Chinese anything like government or anything that can that can fight the Japanese and also uh, build up support among the populace and the peasants and partisan activity behind enemy, enemy lines. In doing so, and remember, during the Japanese war, all the allied men and material and war effort was flowing towards Chiang Kai-shek's government. They would, they, he would be getting the supplies, he would be getting the arms, he would be getting the money that would, funny enough, be embezzled into property um, that the elites would buy in America and Brazil and all these other places. But the communists basically, literally, the only supply they would only resupply if they could encircle and defeat an enemy Japanese army. And this was the same for the Civil War too. At that time, they had no production that they could really speak of. The only supply and arms they could get was from defeat defeating uh, nationalist forces, enemy forces. That's how they got resupplied. Uh, Mao Zedong jokingly, he made a joke later on where. He, they won when they said, you know what, we should give a medal to Chiang Kai-shek because he is truly an outstanding supply officer for our communist army, right? Because fucking, they would get resupplied just from the nationalists, right? By by defeating nationalist units and taking their supplies. Yeah, well, this was what they did with the Japanese as well. This is how they kind of built up their areas where they went from base areas in Yan to basically spreading their influence and power in building up these uh, base areas that were more or less away from Japanese control, like taking it away from Japanese occupied control. And they built up their membership from to the millions at that point. They had, at the end of the World War II, the war against Japan, Chiang Kai-shek built up his army basically from hoarding the supplies and men and material and weapons that he got from the Americans and trying his best not to commit uh, too much to the Japanese forces. He would he would more or less get force the warlords to fight the Japanese uh, instead, right? It's, it's one of the more famous battles like uh, Tai Zhuang was fought by his subordinate Li, uh, Li Zongren, uh, which would be one of his rivals uh, going into the the establishment of uh, the national government, right? Li Zongren was, like I said, the Guangxi clique warlord. But, you know, like, he was facing, preparing for a showdown with the communists uh, at the end of the war. And the communists, you know, basically built up themselves in these, uh, in behind enemy lines. So, as desperate as the war was against Japan, it kind of like awakened, I guess, a, a reality to a lot of people. Whereas before, when you're dealing with warlords and stuff, most of the people, the peasants, the people in the cities, they don't really, they're like, okay, it, they don't really have a care of too much of who wins or who loses because at the end of the day, it's just, you're just fucking paying tax and shit to the new guy in charge, right? When they change hands. But what the Japanese war did was like, this was not just, you know, you can just sit back and let shit happen. At a lot of these places, you might just be fucking killed. Or, you know, like, or this will be like a direct war for the survival of like China as a country. These people started to have this uh, sort of like a more more enhanced perception of, you know, shit shit matters like whoever is in government is going to matter whoever wins might matter right and especially at that during those times like the nationalist um the perception of the nationalist government was pretty low like they were high to the point where they were only high to the point where this was the official chinese government 
you gotta support this, your country against the Japanese. But more, uh, the, the more prestige, more uh, like a respect was given to like the communist uh, armies that were uh, putting up the resistance behind the lines, right? And none of this really gives a better example than what happened in Hunan in 1942. And what happened was, <laughs> oh my god, we should really fucking... Well, we'll talk about 1942 first, and then we'll get to the earlier parts of Guomindang fuck-offs. 42, the Hunan experienced a big, was experiencing really tough famine and shit, right? But they were still hanging in there. Uh, but the nationalist uh, troops that were rolling through, they they need they forced to uh, requisition the grain from all the uh, from most of these villages to fight against the Japanese. And the villagers and the people in the Hunan, in that part of Hunan, were basically telling them, like, if you requisition this grain, like, we're going to starve. We're not going to survive the winter. The nationalists got, uh, the troops were like, and, and the generals were like, uh, we don't give a shit, right? Tang Anbo was, I think, the, the commander of that, that area's army at that time. And funny enough, he was ranked... When they were saying the great, the big four big disasters or whatever to befall Hunan during this area, like he ranked higher above the Japanese, like he was considered a worse disaster than the Japanese was, and you know it's because the Nationals went through gang pressed a bunch as many able bodied men they could go into the army as they could, and this was not like you know the the draft that you think of in like the United States and Canada where it's like oh answer the call your names come up, no this was like. People, soldiers with guns, go into these villages. They round up every single male that was within fighting age or even younger, chain them up like a prison chain gang, and march them out towards the nearest uh, army barracks or depot to get them outfitted for war. And along these ways, these would be called like the gang presses, right? And you know, that's this is a this is a big, this is a pretty prominent. Uh, Topic in Chinese history that usually doesn't get discussed in a lot of these Western books because fucking the Western books really suck. Along the way, a bunch of them would die. Like even uh, a bunch of eyewitnesses at the time, uh, historians, Western ones, when they did talk about it, they'd be like, you know, the attrition rate of these gang pressed armies from these villages, village recruitments, they would almost more more than half of them may not even make it to the barracks by the time. Uh, the nationalists wanted to ret- recruit these guys for the army. Whereas the communists, you got people voluntarily going over them to, to, to go fight in their army, right? The, there was a big contrast in between these two. So Hunan, going back to why this was such a big fuck up, in Hunan, when they came in, gang pressed these guys, took their grain f- to requisition for the army, the peasants at that time was thinking like, well, we're all fucking boned then. But the Japanese kind of enticed them. They came in, hey, if you fight for us, we're going to give you grain. <laughs> Against your own countrymen, we're going to give you grain. And that was enough. Because if you imagine in these areas where they're familiar with famine, with fucking to the point where you, you'll just eat dead family members, if, you, if it gets that dire enough, they're like, fuck it, what choice do we have? Right? So... <laughs> They got enough uh, peasants that actually fought for the Japanese in Hunan, and not in a not in a, like a collaborationist like Wang Jingwei puppet government sort of uh, police gendarmerie deal. <coughs> it was just as long as the Japanese would just give them food, they would fight against the nationalists that took their food away from them. Right, so <laughs> the nationalists actually suffered a bunch of defeats against this peasant army that was that was <laughs> repurposed by the Japanese to fight against the nationalists, which took their grain away from them in the first place. That was a fucking disaster. If you can imagine at the time, there's a fucking disaster, like a PR disaster. And, and this is just adding on. This was in 42. Before in 38, when it was one year after Japan declared war and the, ja- and the nationalists were in, the Kuomintang were in full route away from Shanghai, Nanjing, or whatever... Uh, and, um, they were like saying we gotta fucking slow down the Japanese army. So what did they do? They breached the dikes of the Yellow River. So the they blew up the embankments of the river to wash to basically flood the land to in the attempt to slow down the Japanese army. 
But in doing so, it fucking killed up to a million of peasants that were just in the way of the flood of the of the river embankments, right? Um, so that <laughs> if you just think about it, it was disaster of disaster, just just clown uh fucking moves against more with more clown moves that the nationalists kind of did. And to make matters worse, like Chiang Kai shek loved to play favorites, right? When he would send uh generals to fight against the Japanese, um he would only send reinforcements and material to those requested to the generals that requesting it if he liked them. The ones he didn't like, he would kind of use them as fucking bait and sacrificial lambs to the wolves. And the generals kind of knew this too because at during the course of the war. So then it was at that point they're like, holy shit, man. Like, if I commit my forces and shit and old Chang doesn't fucking like me, like, that's just going to be suicide. You know, I might as well just lay back and fucking not commit. Even if there was a call for reinforcements or whatever, you know, like, if. It may not be answered because I might I might go and fight and there will be none coming if Chiang doesn't if Chiang Kai Shek doesn't like us. Whereas his favorite subordinates, like that fucking asshole Tang Enbo that was that was in Hunan, um, like he would give he would get he would get troops all the time because Chiang Kai Shek liked that guy, right? And then so you got you got generals that would just basically you know that would couldn't they couldn't fight to their full potential because of stupid little uh trick stupid little like fucking shenanigans like this and you know the the ones that were competent the chunk of would kind of feel like they were a threat like Sun Li Ren uh Sun Li Ren was a uh Kuomintang general that was actually trained in in the United States he was in the he went to a uh, officer uh school in the Virginia Military Institute so then he was kind of uh he he was familiar with like the the American point of view of warfare and all that stuff. He was trained by them, and also when Joseph Stillwell, Stillwell, Sitwell, Sitwell, no Stillwell, uh, I'll talk about him in a bit too. So when uh, he didn't fit, basically trust Sunderland because he kind of viewed him as a threat to his power because of his confidence he had the uh, he had the confidence of the American uh, advisors and advising generals as well. Didn't like him, and <laughs> kind of, he made it. He, he did okay. He wasn't. He's a little bit fucking. Um, he's a he's a little bit like boasted up from the Taiwanese side as like this god general. He's okay. He wasn't a fucking god general, because if he was a god general, the Kuomintang wouldn't have lost to the Communist Party in the end, right? Fuck. Um. Yeah, he's uh, Chiang viewed him as a threat and always wanted to fucking find some excuse to fucking imprison him and sideline him. He got the chance to later on when they went to Taiwan. Talking about Joseph Stilwell, Stilwell was, when the Americans went to war against Japan, Stilwell was the general they sent over to kind of uh, prepare the, help prepare the American assistance to Chiang Kai-shek. It was the American based liaison to Chiang Kai-shek's government. Still, when he got to China, he realized himself Chiang Kai-shek was kind of an asshole and he was <laughs> he did not like him at all. And Chiang Kai-shek didn't like him either. Um well, Stillwell was basically saying like this fucking guy, he he is not only complete incompetent uh at what he does, but he's he's also corrupt as hell. Like during this time, a lot of American financial aid was coming in just to prop the government's finances up. Uh, the Chinese government finances up, and a lot of it was getting embezzled by his wife's family, um, and uh, also like high-ranking people under with, uh, under his like uh, cabinet. All this money, money for, and even like assistance to even to build up like the air force. Those funds, you could, they trace them to directly to like. Um, Song Eileen's like husband and her like fucking embezzling and using it to buy real estate. Song Meilin also, they were buying real estate in New York right at the time using this money that was supposed to go to the war effort. Stillwell was saying all this. He's like these corrupt fuckers, man. Like these, uh, this guy's the worst. And kind of all this considerations, were, all the, the reports coming from Stillwell back to back to the the White House was kind of. Actually, it resulted in the White House kind of thinking, you know what? It probably might be better just to go island hopping and to take over these islands in our advancement towards Japan, rather than trying to further um, 
throw more money, men, and material in China where it's not really going anywhere. I mean, Chiang Kai-shek's more or less, he's just using, he's just taking all this assistance and he's saving up for a fight with the communists. You know, like, where, you know, like you, you got to a point where they were building air, they were building the airfields in, in closer to try to strike the Japanese uh, home islands. And, and the Japanese were more or less fucking getting, going on their last legs. Like planes and tanks weren't even getting supplies, enough oil or supplies flowing to them. And the Japanese try at this one last go to try to do an offensive. And it was like, it worked spectacularly well. Like, driven back all the gains the nationalists tried to get over the past, what, it was it like fucking years by that time of the war, right? Like seven years of war, driven back all the gains just with that one last push from the Japanese on low on supplies and oil and shit still. You know, like at that point, still, well, and the Americans were like, you know, Chiang, nothing. This is going nowhere. This assistance to to him against this is not really going nowhere. So, let's just send the Marines in to take fucking like Iwo Jima instead, right? <laughs> um, so that's kind of how, at the end of it, you know, Japan surrenders and everybody, all the forces in. All the Japanese forces in China surrenders too, and this was a huge chunk of it. The Japanese, the Americans, may be only facing maybe at most half of the entire Japanese war machine at the time because the other half, more than millions of whatever men, were tied up in China, right? This quagmire, and the Japanese themselves, you know, China was too big of a country for them to conquer, even with the the nationalists in charge. Because for Chiang Kai-shek's credit, at the very least, he didn't capitulate. He didn't become a puppet like Wang Jingwei did. Um, so all he needed was his fucking time, uh, land and that he could trade, and you know, lives of civilians that he could feed to the Japanese war machine. You know, uh, that take his troops out, they get routed. These towns are vulnerable, but you know, it takes men and men and material from the Japanese side to occupy these places, right? <clears throat> so they eat up their resources like that to the point where they do Pearl Harbor just because, you know, with their projections starting the war at 1937 to 41, they're like, we don't have enough oil supplies to continue this war at its current pace. And we're just stalemating at this point because we're spreading so thin trying to occupy this large area in China. And the collaborationist armies are Wang Jingwei's collaborationist governments near useless at trying to maintain order as well. So <clears throat> they're saying, you know, we got if if America embargoes us, it's done. We have to do something drastic to keep the oil supplies flowing, or else we're not going to. We're just going to stalemate in China. Pearl Harbor. So Americans embargo them. Pearl Harbor happened. Japanese surrender. Right now. Um. The funny thing is now is uh, now it's it's a resumption of Communist Party versus Nationalist Party, Mao Zedong versus Chiang Kai Shek. And even during the war, they would they would be incidents where they fought each other. Like the the communist contributions to the Nationalist Army was the Eighth Root Army and the New Fourth Army. These were communist troops that got reconstituted as nationalist, uh, conventional nationalist divisions, like armies, or bigger than divisions, they were armies, right? And I think late in the war, the nationalists actually came to blows with the new fourth army of the communists and fucking just decimated them. During the war with Japan, mind you, they started to fucking fight amongst themselves and shit. So after the war, all bets were almost kind of off. But America, for its credit, was trying to keep the peace. And so were the Soviet Union at that time, too. Because, um, like I said, Stalin wanted Stalin was victorious in his war, and he wanted to kind of keep his concessions that he won from Chiang Kai-shek in the warm water ports in uh, Port Arthur, Liu Shun. <clears throat> um, and America, obviously, you know, like, Chiang Kai-shek was basically their client state at that point, and they were saying, you know, this is good for American influence in Asia, especially against communism, you know, this is good. Um, but at that time in America, before the McCarthy era happened with their own purge of communists, you had enough sympathizing people 
they weren't really sympathizing with communism, but they were sympathizing with at least the communists were like a relevant, uh, a comp- uh, competent fighting force against Japan, earned enough respect from people like Stilwell and uh, later on the, the United States Army Chief of Staff George Marshall. That was the guy that did the Marshall Plan for Europe at the end of the war. While he came in to China to try to mediate some peace between the communists and the nationalists, right? So they he would go to the the communist base areas in North China to to talk with Mao Zedong and all those guys. Mao Zedong was receptive to um, like, yeah, let's let's have peace, right? Because he doesn't have a crystal ball. He doesn't know that the nationalists will get so fucking whooped, and then the communists would actually win the civil war. The best he was hoping for was. <clears throat> Get enough power and influence to become to be considered seriously as part of the government, of part of the nationalist government. You know, allow communists to to take part in government. You know, and allow communists to maintain uh, their own power as well. So this started the Chongqing negotiations. Uh, I think it was called like the Double Ten negotiations in English or whatever, where <clears throat> Mao Zedong would fly to Chongqing, where to try to broker to try to come to talks, American-sponsored talks with uh, the, the nationalist government, and Chiang Kai-shek had to receive him as a, as a guest too, right? Lots of press was made of this. It was in the newspapers. They're both toasting each other, and, you know, the headlines were like, oh, if this finally peace has come. But obviously not. Like, Chiang Kai-shek was gearing up to fight them. He would, to the point where even the... Uh, <clears throat> when the Japanese surrendered in China, the directive that went out from the Americans was the Japanese could only surrender to either receiving American forces or nationalist forces. They were not to surrender to communist forces, which was, which if, if some people, when they see this, are like, why, what does that mean? The communists, if you recall, were the only power that was in the occupied, that were functioning in the occupied territories. So, where places where the communists were, the Japanese basically didn't have control over the countrysides. The Japanese could occupy the cities and maybe select rail lines, but around the countryside surrounding all the cities, if it was communist base area territory, the communists controlled those areas. Everybody was, and the people in those areas were supporting, giving intelligence, giving food, um, supplies and shit to communists, to the communist party. So when Japan surrendered, this entire swath of northern China that was under Japanese occupation, they were going to—they were literally going to be flipped into the communists if the, the Americans and the nationalists didn't give this direction to the Japanese uh, surrendering forces. You can only surrender to the receiving nationalists or the Americans, and this was to the point where the the. The Americans would provide strategic airlift to nationalist troops to go into North China, into Manchuria, to try to beat the communists from consolidating, from from uh, getting even more control in these areas. This was this was the situation in China at that time. Like the nationalists had mass American backing, mass support, international recognition uh, uh, from all the countries in the world, and. You now with like expanded, saved up military might, <clears throat> with mili- and American support, time to resume the civil war. Time to use American strategic, you know, like logistics capabilities uh, and, and power to fucking carry on this war. And they were doing it with the population stacked against them. They had to deliberately and forcefully go into these areas to receive the Japanese surrender, because otherwise these people were just going to fucking flip to the, the communists, right? Even to the point where the, the Japanese forces that they were fighting before then, uh, they core, they were basically got them to fight the communists now. So in like places like Shanxi, where Yan Xishan was, the local Japanese commander, after the, the Japanese surrender, uh, Yan Xishan was like, hey, fight for us now against the communists. You know, Chiang Kai-shek was like, fight for us now against the communists. And also he had, you know, he he had some comradries for some of uh, some Japanese uh, uh, generals during his time when he studied in Japan, more or less. He was more amenable. He, he, was, he can be friendly with them, right? 
So you got the Japanese to, who are the enemies of the Chinese people during the entire World War, entirety of World War II, flip sides immediately and start resuming the civil war to fight the Chinese communists. And if this was a war that, like, on paper, everything favored the nationalists, even with the communists expanded base areas from, like, you know, the numbers in the thousands when they reached Yan'an to millions by the end of the World War II, the nationalists were still by far the large military power, especially with all the material support in tanks, airplanes, fuel, everything from the United States, right? United States even had marine garrisons in some of these areas where the nationalists can reach you, but the communists had a lot of uh, a lot of clout, especially in these areas like Shandong, Dongbei, like Manchuria, right? And as the civil war unfolds, you can see these areas. They were the first ones to flip, because uh, when the civil war, civil war resumed, and uh, you know negotiations failed, these were the communist areas where they they had sort of the base area where they can actually start to manufacture things. They'd have to move the factories, the makeshift factories around every so often when the nationalist bombers came, and uh, the the air raids came to bomb shit, but. It was enough to a point where, you know, you had communist areas that would that were sufficient enough to farm, to supply their own armies and to produce material to actually take this from guerrilla warfare to an actual conventional war, division versus division. The communist divisions were obviously fucking guys with just captured weapons, most and foremost, right? And I got a lot. There's a lot of like fucking ty- uh, like nationalist fanboys that would be like, oh, if. You know, if if the Russians didn't help the communists, you know, the nationalists would have won. Or if the Japanese didn't surrender wholesale their entire uh, Kantogun army and all their men and material and all their guns and ammo in the Manchuria, all oh, the fucking nationalists would have won. Well, that's all. <laughs> it's all a bunch of fanboy horseshit. Soviet Union still supporting Chiang Kai Shek because you know Stalin had a lot of gains from his negotiations that he didn't want to lose. He didn't think the communist uh, Mao was going to win. So first, even during Huai Hai, which was the final campaign, the Soviet Union was still supporting the nationalists. At that point, the communists were basically on their way towards Nanjing. And Stalin was still saying, like, you know, fucking let's let's cool it down, let's stop the fighting, you know. <coughs> and the Kantogun in Manchuria is even a further laugh because at that point, fucking like when the Soviet Union ran them through. They were like basically a gut a gutted unit. They were all a skeleton fucking army in that in that in Manchuria, right? And whatever the Soviets could take, they basically dismantled. When they came into Manchuria uh, during the tail end of World War Two, dismantled everything they could take, industrial wise, machinery and all that stuff from the Japanese in Manchuria, shipped it back to the Soviet Union to rebuild. Left like bare skeleton in Manchuria. For, and so when the communists came, he's like, whatever. You think there was like a treasure trove of weapons and shit? It was, it was like a normal amount of like whatever, of old Japanese arms. no, Basically no fuel for anything. Um, just ragtag groups of uh, assortments of small arms and shit. You know, and maybe like just some weak-ass Japanese tanks. That... Don't really make it that much of a difference because in the end when they rolled through and won the Civil War, the communists were riding like American-made Sherman tanks that were captured from the nationalists, right? Mater- men and material, big portion of it was always from um, defeating the nationalists to gain the bulk of their material and their a- ammunition and even fuel um, if they can. So... Uh, so these base areas, Shandong, Manchuria, they were one of the first areas to be like the Jiefang Chu, the liberated areas, right? Chiang Kai-shek was, and these were the areas where Chiang Kai-shek first got there. His armies airlifted in as fast as he can to to fight, to to set up a base, set up uh, strongholds against this this encirclement of communist territory, right? So it kicks off, right? Civil Wars kicks off, and it kicks off the big battles first happened in Manchuria. This was called the Liaoshen Campaign. And at this point, this was when the communists first get their first field enough p- 
people to actually do set piece battles, right? Infantry versus inf- infantry, and it's usually at this point it's infantry versus airlifted in nationalist heavy equipment. You know, they'll have enough for like fucking mech, at least some kind of mechanized war fighting capability, but they fucking lose on the field against the communists. The communists are just more motivated, they're more battle-hardened from this shit, and also nationalist soldiers, if you recall how they get recruited, the majority of their enlisted men, they don't really have the heart, in, 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 their heart's not in the game, they're not, you know, they're fucking gang press from some village conscript, and when the communists fucking roll through, they're saying, yo, brother, you know, comrade, whatever, Xiongdi, come on, why don't you just come over to our side, you know, like, we're not your enemies or whatever, we're peasants, we're farmers, fucking, you're farmers, we're like, well, you, you, what, you're gonna fight for some rich guy to fucking keep on taking all your shit back then? So yeah, they would get huge defections from the nationalists to the communists at the sa- while they're fighting, right? <clears throat> The Aoshen campaign happens, and the communists could have enough men and material to actually lay siege to Changchun. And it was a really bloody siege. A lot of people died in it. Like, fucking... It's it's a black mark on both their histories, right? The siege. A lot of people starved to death in that siege in Changchun. Like, nationalists wouldn't let the, wouldn't let the uh, population leave. The communists wouldn't send in food supplies to the population just because they're laying siege to nationalists. But they take it down, and north they the communists take it right, and northeast fucking Manchuria just starts to crumble. The nationals just spectacularly start to crumble, and it is, <laughs> all these men that Chiang Kai Shek airlifted over there, they just fucking crumble in northeast China. And you know, before you know the communists, at the most they were thinking they were in their negotiations with Chiang Kai Shek. What they were negotiating for was, like I said, a bigger role in government. That's literally what they won. They didn't think that they were going to win in an all-out battle. They were just like, look, we did our part in fighting the Japanese, and we do our part in our revolution. You know, um, you have to recognize us. You'd be stupid not to. Chiang Kai-shek was kind of like saying, yeah, well, you know, like... Uh, no, he was. He, there was not really his, his plan was just to fucking annihilate them because he had the strength to. Now at the end of World War Two, but also he was saying he would give these terms that communists probably wouldn't be able to accept. He'd be like, you know what? I will accept some members of you having some positions in government, <laughs> like some positions in like the propaganda arm of government, right? Uh, but in return, you cannot keep your own army. You have to fold into the Guomindang and that's that. Like you're not gonna be have substantial positions, but you can be a part of this government in these smaller capacities. Communists for their part, they remember what the purge was like, right? They were saying like you can't there's no way. Like the historical events have taught the communists taught them that you need an army to defend yourselves against, or else it's just gonna be nineteen twenty seven all over again and they're just gonna purge you whenever whenever they feel like the next day. And Chiang Kai-shek, everybody knows Chiang Kai-shek has all this men and material ready for a fight. Like, this guy does not want to share power with anyone. And it's, and now that all the warlords were kind of like, got kind of got their influence and power just, just swept over during the Japanese war, Chiang Kai-shek was basically unopposed. Like, he was the strongest war, the strongest guy bar none, you know. At the most, he would just... He would just be uh, fucking fuming and molding that Li Zongren from Guangxi still had his army and his base of power. But, you know, like, he would fuck with him through, like, the Guomindang internal elections, right? Like, he, he didn't even want Li Zongren to become vice president, but Li Zongren got voted in as vice president. Chiang Kai-shek wasn't happy, told Li Zongren. He's basically telling Li Zongren to fuck himself. But, like, he was, aside from Li Zongren, um, Chiang Kai-shek was... The, he basically had all the military power. No obstacles in front of him except these communists. He wasn't going to share power with them. Like anybody fucking from a mile away can, can see this. But shit starts to change because the communists actually start to win these set peace battles, like army to army battles, not guerrilla warfare and circle the army and, you know, fucking take supplies and shit. Uh, but actually, like divisions of communists of the People's Liberation Army, which is now what it was called, would win 
in in these on the battlefield against the nationalists, and the nationalists were also defecting, like the ones that would facing this communist onslaught were thinking, you know what, fucking let's just surrender. A lot of them were surrendering, like big division level surrenders, like tens of thousands of people would they throw down arms and join the communists. Liaoshan was a fucking disaster for the for uh, the nationalists, but they were they still had still had the upper hand because. You know, they're saying, okay, well, maybe we lost the Northeast, we lost Manchuria, let's make the stand at the next line. The next line was the Beijing Tianjin uh, uh, fucking line. And so, and so this will start of what was the next campaign called the uh, Pingjing campaign. I think it's Pingjing campaign. Uh, it's supposed to be Beiping, Tianjin, right? Pingjing. Yeah, Pingjing campaign. So this was the fight over Beijing and Tianjin. At the time, Beijing was called Beiping because the capital was in Nanjing. So Beijing was not called, didn't have the Jing word. Jing means capital. Um, <clears throat> Pingjing started and then uh, Chiang Kai-shek was tasking Fu Zuoyi, who was the commander in the Beijing area, to be like, you, you will make the last stand. You will make a stand against the communists here. Right, and he made the, the he made the flights out, the trips out to inspect the troops at the front lines at Hubei and 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 Hebei and Beijing and all those areas. All right, Fu Zuoyi is like, right, no problem. <laughs> Fu Zuoyi, who was the the mayor's like, well, the the head guy in Beijing, his daughter was actually a member of the Communist Party, so it was like. You know, you got you got some funny family fucking co- dinner conversations there, where it's like her daughter would be like, "Dad, why don't you just join the communists? The nationalists are clearly gonna fucking lose." And Fu Zuoyi, Fu Zuoyi said some famous thing was like, "You know, if Mao Zedong can fucking beat, uh, can fucking beat me, I will be his fucking, I will be his whipping boy at the end. I will fucking be his fucking servant. I'll open car doors for him. I'll be his, um, I'll be his fucking like." Servant, if he wins, right? Obviously, and at the end, fucking Mao won, so he had to eat his words and whatever. But they were lenient on him uh, when when he kind of surrendered, and they were lenient on him because he kind of he surrendered. He the communists came or were bearing down on him. The nationals lost those pitch battles in the Pingjian campaign, and then Fu Zuo is looking at basically an exposed Beijing facing this facing the the advancing communists surrendered the city, and it, that was that, and that was where the communists sort of said like, uh, you know what, this is our capital, Beijing is our capital, um, and then they eventually Beijing will become the capital for the, for them, right? Uh, but the final campaign that was going to be fought was between the last. At this point, the nationalists were kind of realizing the tide's turning. They don't enjoy as much superiority in their numbers and 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 web and material anymore. And also at this point, the United States was kind of like backing away. They're like, "Yeah, I don't want to involve myself in too much in this Asia and a land war in Asia." And and you know, Marshall and Stillwell's um, reports about how fucking corrupt the nationalists were dissuaded the Americans. Like Truman did not was not liking Chiang Kai-shek, and he was like, I'm not giving more money to this crook. So they started, they were like, they turned off the spigots to their massive amounts of material money supply that they were given in. And plus the U.S. Marines were like, starting to, since the communists were coming down to those areas, the U.S. Marines in Tsingdao and those areas were looking at, well, you may have to fight the communists. So at that point they're like, yeah, let's not escalate this shit. Let's let's get the fuck out of there and let them let the Chinese deal with their own problem, right? Chiang Kai Shek was kind of panicking at this point, but he still had he still had the advantage, and he was thinking this is the last advantage. We're gonna fight in this big fucking battle at it was called Huai Hai, the Huai Hai campaign, the final campaign in forty eight, and. They were going to fight this one last pitch battle, and this was the do-or-die part. He's putting in all his best men, his best divisions, best everything, and they had, you know, the more numbers, right? This was this was where they were going to make the stand. And I think it was, this was called Huai Hai, because it was near the Huai River and um, this other place. So this was, 
at the line where it divides North China and South China, right? If you if the communists win at Huaihai, then uh, the Huaihai campaign, then they will have straight road all the way down to Nanjing, which is the the Kuomintang capital. And spoiler alert, they fucking lost. Uh, they fucking got fucking stomped. The nationalists did. Uh, on that point, Chiang Kai-shek was thinking, yeah, this is not really... Uh, <laughs> our station, our position is not really tenable anymore. So he started his retreat again, right? He retreated to Wuhan, and he retreated to uh, like Ch- Chengdu, and he was saying he was organizing like last stand defense getting the defenders mind you to organize last stand defenses in these areas he's extorting them uh, defend the city to the last man even if you all die and then he just hops on a plane and goes to the next city <laughs> eventually makes his way to Taiwan and that's where he brings you know that's where the history is played out from nowadays Taiwan and mainland China right fucking went in disgrace and before then he gave a gift to his vice president president Li Zongren where it's like here, I abdicate power of the uh, presidency. You're president now. You deal with this mess. He's Chiang Kai-shek. I think he left. Chiang Kai-shek still retained all the control, the majority control of of the Kuomintang army. The Zhongren was this poor sap that was that was just like given this fucking impossible task, and you know, like here, you your it's your responsibility now to defend the mainland. And Lee Zorin is like, okay, yeah, yeah, right, go fuck yourself, right? Fucking see, he was forced to fucking like retreat and also, and also retreat back as well. Um, and then you know the rest is history, right? Um, and then throughout the 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 communist uh, administration on the mainland, that'll probably be another episode. Jesus, it takes like took three hours and maybe another episode to answer this question, but. This is all for what is what would it be like if Chiang Kai Shek won. He simple quest answer is he couldn't fucking win. Even if Mao Zedong died, even if there wasn't a communist party, it was bad enough that is something would oppose him. Whether or not it would be another charismatic lord lord or any of these guys that were just out for, to get him, like his regime at especially at the end, and starting it from the purge till the end, was a a dead regime. It was a dead man walking regime, because inciting with the reactionary element in Chinese society, it's literally just fucking siding with the Qing, the old remnants of the Qing dynasty. What's the difference between you know like uh, the Japanese puppet re- made up of the old guard of the Qing dynasty, the the um, Manchu 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 Guo Manchu Guo in English um, regime and his reactionary regime, right? Like. It's all the old power, the old remnant reactionary power, the one that your revolution, you know, your Xinhai 1911 Kuomintang revolution was supposed to overthrow. If you're going back to that power base, then fucking you're dead man walking. You're, 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 you're at the end of your, what, what survival are you going to have? You're not going to win. Just, just by the period of time, over time, if you keep on that road, you're going to get overthrown, Right? The material, like this, the the way it is, this the way the societal structure is. Like they don't, they're not. People aren't going to stand for that shit anymore. You know, they want to get rid of the Qing Dynasty. They want to get rid of that feudal um, make of a society. But if you double down, double down on that same feudal make of a society as your power base, that sh- you're you're asking for it. You're just going to get defeated again, and that's exactly what played out. Like. Mao Zedong, yeah, he was fucking, he, fuck, by all, and all the odds stacked against him. And his Communist Party, at that point, you know, uh, abandoning Jiangxi and going on a long march to go to Yan, at any point, it could have fucking been done. But they didn't. And they kept alive. They, they were survived because they had the people that, were, that would support them. If you had the population supporting you, fucking, you, you could die get defeated eight times, ten times, twenty times, but you can't, you know, like, it's you can't stamp him out. But for Chiang Kai-shek, it was, he could not even lose one time. He could not afford to lose even once because he just, the the, the, the population was against him at that, at that point. 
he had nothing to offer them. That he was he was the obstacle against what people perceive what they can improve their station in life. But that brings to the question of why you can't compare Taiwan to what happened in Taiwan to mainland China now, because ironically, when Chiang Kai Shek had to retreat to Taiwan, Taiwan for about fifty years, give or take, at that point was under was ever since uh, China lost in the uh, Jiawu uh, Zhanzheng in 19, 1894, Taiwan was ceded as a colony to Japan, and Japan developed and ruled over Taiwan for those 50 years. The power base in Taiwan was more or less owed their position to the Japanese. So when the Japanese surrendered and the Taiwan was retroceded to China, Chiang Kai-shek was not beholden to the landowning power base in Taiwan. So while in mainland China he could not even dream or want to deal with landlord and the land distribution problem, he could do it in Taiwan because all those guys that that made their name or got their riches or made a fucking uh, wealth for themselves in Taiwan did so under the Japanese and they were and they were patrons to the Japanese. They weren't patrons to him. So when his forces and everybody retreated to Taiwan, he could do the exact same land redistribution that the that the communists did in mainland China. He did that. Ironically, like full irony uh, and full seriousness. He did that in Taiwan, and that's how he consolidated himself and Taiwan there. So when his son, Jiang Jingguo, came to power and to develop the economy, the land distribution provided that needed kick where all the peasants, they, they had that surplus base of, 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 of agriculture to build up, uh, to attract investment first and foremost, and to build up, to advance their economy, to build it up that way. And let's not forget that in Taiwan, you get a big boost because when Chiang Kai-shek left the mainland, he took all the remaining gold reserves, all the remaining, the treasury of the government of the entire country and took it with him to Taiwan. And also, uh, in in America at that time, maybe Truman and George Marshall and those guys didn't want to, they didn't want to support Chiang Kai-shek in the Civil War because he was a crook, right? But McCarthy, the McCarthyism reaction didn't happen where they saw that China, that China was lost to the communists, lost in quotation marks, because it was never the fucking Americans, the, something the Americans don't fucking lose. It's Chinese people for Chinese people, right? Fuck the Americans. <laughs> but when they saw that they lost it, McCarthy era, McCarthyism became full swing. And this paranoia about communism was everywhere. And the Soviet Union was at a strong point too. So <clears throat> that point... You know, like who? Even if Chiang Kai Shek was a crook, they were they turned back on the spigots to support him, right? And especially when the Korean War kicked off, when Kim Jong uh, Kim Il Sung invaded down in the south, that's when the U.S. resumed like the military assistance even to Taiwan. China didn't even enter that war for at least the next couple months for the Korean War. And they sent the U.S. sent like the Seventh Fleet or whatever right into the Taiwan Strait and basically declared like, yeah, Taiwan's off limits. We're back in the game again. America's going to guarantee Taiwan's security, right? And in the the anti-communists going on in America was just saying, hey, whatever assistance Chiang Kai-shek needs, we will provide it to him. So that and his regime on Taiwan. So Taiwan's economy. When Jiang Jingguo came into power, he had <clears throat> first of all redistributed all. Everybody had a new lease on everything, on life in the economy, and had all this productive potential from the redistribution of land to the peasants, the peasantry, and the workers in Taiwan. Also, this huge, massive U.S. economic assistance, and also like even um, economic. Uh, uh, assistance like economic assistance in a way where Taiwan could put up tariffs on agricultural products of their own uh, against Americans but Americans would defer to them they wouldn't put up any kind of tariffs for Taiwan uh, Taiwanese commodities and that way it protects the Taiwanese farmers from actually building up their agricultural base and going into and getting that 
you know, that money, that investment, that American foreign direct investment to build up Taiwan, ready spigots of money to go to go into industry and shit and mechanization and whatnot in Taiwan. That was not well. That Chiang Kai Shek kind of just squandered while he was on the mainland. If he was holding on to the mainland, none of this could really. He could never get any of this to happen. He wouldn't be able to do the land re- redistribution. He wouldn't be able to do to break up the fucking the, the the monopolies of the landlords and shit. His family would still be embezzling money like they did during the war and even after the war, right? Fucking, they kind of you know like he, even even. <laughs> He kind of got, he kind of clamped down a little on his, uh, his officials, uh, corruption because he was just furious by how he fucking lost the mainland, right? Um, and Jiang Jingguo was witnessing this firsthand during his formula of years in the mainland. And he, when he came to power, fucking, yeah, he didn't really tolerate that. He didn't tolerate this massive embezzlement of funds as well, right? So he could direct enough of funds. To, uh, to develop the uh, the Taiwan instead. Um, but on the mainland, like what the what the communists achieved was, uh, it was a big deal. If you think about <clears throat> what was the Nanjing decade looking like, right during the peak of Chiang Kai Shek's power, during the peak of uh, Republic of China prosperity on the mainland, like at most you can say dismal shit, like. If you're lucky, you can work as a waitress in fucking Shanghai, or you can uh, be uh, part of the banking clique if you can get up there, in with uh, with the Kong family and the Song family and all the, the these these big oligarch families that controlled the finance, the, the 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 money and power in in China at the time, right? That was the best you can hope for. Otherwise, you're still living the same shitty life, maybe even worse. You know, even during the golden years, you're getting famines. It was ridiculous, right? And then, you know, like, nowadays in Western education, everything is always enhanced on Great Leap Forward. The three years of famine you experienced during the Great Leap Forward, and you'd be like, yeah, see have what a mess the communist was. You know, like, but <laughs> everybody... <laughs> Everybody in China was armed at that time. Everybody, if they, if it was anything as bad as the Chiang Kai-shek regime, you know, fucking Mao Zedong himself said, you know, fucking we should be overthrown then. And I would encourage us to be overthrown if we were just as bad, if we were just as ass-bungling incompetent as they were. Comparatively, like the worst years, like I said, were fucking already on par with the best years of the Kuomintang. So the peasants didn't fucking rebel. Even when they were facing the hardship, they viewed it as, oh, it's that perennial famine thing that's coming that everybody's already experienced in their lifetimes. Like, this is a normal thing. Fucking, it's just, you know, we're just experiencing it again. Oh, well, you know, fucking, you know, it's the same shit, you know, all, all the time. But that was their attitude during the great, during the, the, during the hardest hit areas of the famine of Great Leap. But during the Great Leap, uh, still, like, the country was getting built up at the same time. So then places where there would be annual flooding or perennial flooding of places where it's like you're flipping a coin for harvest, whether it floods or if you get drought, this is whether your family survives or not. It actually got solved perpetually now because of all the land work stuff, the collective land work that they did embark on. It basically it basically re-irrigated these lands that were did not have that could not be farmed, now they could be farmed and throughout the year. And uh, embankments that used to burst, they wouldn't burst anymore. The, the river works were actually done. Even it's talking about during the Great Leap times, they were done in a way where the work ensured that now these lands were fucking uh, worked on and developed and uh, built in place. The infrastructure for agriculture was built in these areas. So even you got Great Leap... Um, as soon as you come out of that, you're in a good position. And all they did to come out of that was lowered the quotas. That's all they did. They realized that well, I think the, the the local cadres were exaggerating their numbers and they were going to lower the quota and then also put in safeguards to say, you know, like the cadre can't, don't have the final say in what the quotas for the collective quotas would be. That alone, like, built up the country enough that they had enough 
development capacity and uh, enough productive capacity to invest in research into like fucking the nuclear bomb and shit, right? So that should already tell you, like, even with no no outside invest investment for the communists, you don't get the you don't get the advantage of um, almost unlimited American foreign direct investment credit post World War Two to rely on. You don't have the res- gold reserves that the pre- the entire treasury that the previous government took of them to develop us the entire country's treasury to develop a small island. You don't have that. You're barely working with bare bones. And also for communist China at the time, the Soviet Union was they had a big falling out with them under Khrushchev. So you don't even get like the Soviet assistance uh, for industrialization anymore it's literally everything by yourself you gotta you gotta build up everything by yourself and they did it to the point where in 64 you have enough uh, your country's uh, productive capacity was met enough that you could develop the fucking bomb at the same time <laughs> right while maintaining uh, an economy that had to serve at that point, what are that? 500 million people? Well, not even... Uh, yeah, 500 million people, give or take. Life expectancy under the People's Republic of China from Mao's tenure from 49 to 76 went from 30-something to near 70 years old. So people that were fucking just living shit lives in, in the Republican time during this tenure, even taking into account the famine years of the Great Leap Forward, seventy is like seventy close to seventy years of age. I think more than seventy years of age actually. And it's in the numbers. Like the Qing Dynasty at the the end of the Qing Dynasty, fucking the population was what, three hundred million ish, three hundred fifty million ish? During the entire time of the Republic of China on the Chinese mainland. And this was before the Japanese invasion too. That population never changed that much. Chiang Kai-shek's, during Chiang Kai-shek's reign, it was basically 350 million. And you think about 1911, you know, the census done in the Qing Dynasty was before 1911. It was like in 1890-something. 350 million-ish, 1890, all the way down to 1949. Fucking, well, okay, not before, even before 1949. 37 population's unchanged. That means like there's enough people dying that <laughs> the the births don't even give you a net population increase. So to close out, uh the one final thing that kinda ensured that okay, well if the Americans hate the Chinese mainland and the communists so much back then and the communists were at their weakest point, why couldn't you just do a pull in Iraq? Why can't you just be in there and be like, ah, oh, there's weapons of mass destruction sort of deal? Just be like, just fuck China up. Why couldn't Chiang Kai-shek just come back, come back with, with American support? Fuck China up, right? <clears throat> what happened was the consolidate the, the 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 most powerful consolidation of the communist um, uh, uh, foothold and the, their power of the mainland was the Korean War. And this has to be viewed within the context of the Chinese century of humiliation where the Qing dynasty just got wrecked by European powers. And from that point on, they just they couldn't fucking win against, uh, against foreign powers carving the country up. What the communists did was kind of like, they, they, they fought back. So during the Civil War, they, they were like a ragtag group, but... Um, there was one in- incident called the HMS Amethyst incident where it was a British uh, gunboat that was patrolling the Yangtze River that was near, you know, Shanghai, Nanjing, in that area. And then, <clears throat> you know, at this point, it's a common sight for foreign military gunboats, foreign military soldiers do whatever they want. They, they can do whatever they want, go wherever they want, all over China. It's basically treated as their own fucking turf. Well, the Chinese got to the Yangtze uh, bank embankment, and they're like, "What is that? A British ship? Yeah, fucking shell it!" So they fucking fired upon the British ship, and to the Kuomintang government, it was like an unthinkable thing. Like, how can you attack? And and to the people in the population of the Kuomintang areas, they're like, "Oh, really? Like, even the Kuomintang government would not ever dare to attack a a foreign establishment, a foreign concession or establishment." 
So at that point, they're like, yeah, you know what? These guys, these communists, fucking, they, they, they shot it. They fired at the British ship. They fucking basically almost sunk the whole damn thing. And Britain, for its part, they're like, well, what can they do? Like, they didn't want to get into a shooting war. They didn't want their British uh, assets in, in, in China to get into a shooting war with the communists. And they're like, okay, fuck it. Just, just let it go or whatever, right? <laughs> let, them, let them shell the ship. And there you go. So that was like kind of a taste to a bunch of Chinese people at the time. They're like, you know what? These guys, they may be the real deal. Like if we were talking about standing up to the, the foreigners, these guys are, are getting are getting that uh, credibility. And then the main one, aside from, you know, fucking the, the, the entire country fighting the Japanese, right? This was a European ship getting shelled by... A, Chi- uh, a Chinese army. This was a big deal, right? Um, but during what made it happen was the Korean War. What what really catapulted their fucking prestige on the mainland. Where whereas you know in forty nine they win the war. Fifty nineteen fifty Korean War starts right. In forty nine when they consolidated power, you still had enough of like kind of uh, resistance and some reluctance, especially among the upper strata of Chinese society, especially in the Jiangnan area, where it's like Zhejiang, Jiangsu, and those areas where Chiang Kai-shek's power base was, right? Because they're like, it's your intellectuals, your bankers, your owners, or whatever. They're like, fucking, yeah, the communists, they're not in it for us, they're in it for those the unwashed masters, right? I don't really like this regime that much. What turned those guys around was anybody that was sympathetic to, um, you know, like, Avenging, I guess, the century of humiliation, standing up to European powers or Western powers. That was the Korean War is what did it for them. What made them say, you know what, I can get behind this regime. I can get behind this, the, the communist government, right? Rather than a nationalist one. Is During the Korean War, when uh, MacArthur uh, did his Incheon landing to push back Kim Il sung, and then they, the UN forces, it was just America. And you know, fifteen other countries, including Canada, Britain, and uh, and uh, even like Philippines and some of these countries, Turkey, you know, pushed the North Koreans all the way back across the thirty eighth parallel, up towards the border of China. Well, MacArthur himself was kind of was a strong anti communist guy. He was he was uh, he was part of like the the poster boy for the eventual McCarthy era guys that that did the communist purge. He hated communism. He had despised uh, the communist government in China. He was openly saying stuff like, you know, fucking, you know what? I welcome them to come fight. If they fight, we'll, f- we'll, fucking, re- we'll fucking overthrow them. We'll march past the Yalu River. That's the border between China and the uh, United States and uh, Nor- North Korea. We'll go in there. We'll get, we'll unleash Chang. This is where that stupid phrase came from unleash Chang. Unleash, we'll unleash Jiang Ziyashi's army back against the mainland, you know. We'll fucking nuke him too. His plan was like, if the Chinese wanted to dare fight us, uh, the the Americans, he would fucking rain radioactive cobalt all across the northeast into Manchuria. He would goad them into fighting too. Like, you know, fucking let's not stop here. If I had the chance, if I had, if, if I had to go ahead, the green light, I would march straight into Manchuria. Uh, the Chinese government could, you know, see this at the time. They crossed the thirty eighth parallel. They're heading towards the border, and they're like, you know what? Just, just stop at the thirty eighth, please. Like, if like we're viewing this as a threat, your generals like pretty much just saying that he would love it. He would love nothing better than to fucking go, cross the border into China and to help the nationalists retake the mainland. You know, and talking about if the conflict did happen, he would consider nuking fucking radioactive cobalt all over Manchuria. You know, like, like we're warning you to stop at the 38th parallel, right? He didn't, obviously. He didn't. MacArthur didn't. Truman, at that point, everybody's riding the high of pushing the North Koreans back. Um, Truman was even saying, like, you know, like, if you can do it, if you're going to push him up, let's push him up. Why not? Why stop at the 38th? Let's push him. Ignored the Chinese warnings of that over there, basically pushed all the way to Yalu. Started even shelling in some cases over, passed over the border into into Chinese, uh, like uh, Dandong. Um, so then, 
at that point, you know, they reached the Yalu River, the UN forces did, and then the Chinese fucking, they, are, they entered the war, and they pushed them back to the 38th parallel. And this was a big deal to the Chinese population, because it was basically China versus the United States and 14 other countries that just made up the Allied forces of World War II, right? This country that was basically made up of a ragtag group of peasants originally, uh, uh, this this government, and this country that fielded basically an army of just people with right with equipped with rifles and maybe a sack of flour for provisions, put <clears throat> push back that UN army right, and to this day the, to the Americans Korean War is viewed as a stalemate because war started at the thirty eighth parallel for them ended at the thirty eighth parallel right, well for the Chinese this is a definite win because. He, he, the war started for them at the Yalu border, put and it ended at the thirty eighth parallel against forces that were like exponentially more stronger. You know, the United States. Like, if you were going to talk about uh, standing up to a Western, showing your people you can stand up to a Western power, the United States, the preeminent Western power, getting pushed back to the thirty eighth parallel, even if it was a straw for stalemate at the thirty eighth, that is a definite win to the Chinese people. That's the equivalent of like Mike Tyson in his prime getting beaten back by getting getting fucking beat to a draw to f- from a guy that's like 80 pounds, <laughs> from a guy that doesn't box and is 80 pounds, right? Fucking Mike Tyson, he would be fu- he would be like what the fuck just happened? That was what the Americans were thinking, what the fuck just happened? And the Chinese were thinking, you know, fucking that that is it. Like that fucking that was the proving ground, right there. So, you know, taking all this into like uh, <laughs> rounding it about, I guess, because I've already spent way too much time on this shit. Um, what would Chiang Kai? What would it look like if Chiang Kai Shek won? Okay, let's assume if he could win. You know, his power is just it's a time bomb of just him trying to hang on to his reactionary power base as long as he could, with little to no material, very little practical material development to the rest of the country, and just concentrating as much wealth and power to basically his boys and his elites and the upper strata of society in Shanghai and Nanjing, as was seen during his Nanjing prosperity decade. Um, China wouldn't be where it was right now. There would be no meaningful independence at all, because uh, you know you wouldn't get like the, what happened with the PRC, where they faced off against both the United States and the Soviet Union, right? China, Chiang's, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's Jiang Jieshu was functionally ever since the entrance of America into World War Two, he was functionally like a client state to the U.S. And whatever talks he had about like opposing imperialism and you know carving out a position for himself. And even like going against American wishes, it was all wishes. It was all like, more or less, it was like diary wishes. And the mainland uh, people like on the mainland like to make a joke online when they call like uh, Chiang Kai Shek uh, the, the diary emperor or whatever, right? For the fucking general by diary. Whereas he had all these grand plans and all the fantasies of what he would be. You know, he's fucking seven feet taller in his diary and his dick is like ten, <laughs> 10 inches longer in his diary. But it's all just in his diary, right? All his fantasies of what he wanted, what how st- such a strong China he would build, is all just musings of what he would, fantasies he would fantasize about in his diary. And in real life, none of, none of that shit ever played out, even when he was at the height of his power. And ironically, he had to resort to communists... Uh, print, uh, strategies of economic development when he went into when he was pushed back to Taiwan to to start Taiwan on the path of being a economic power, and it was really under his son Jiang Jingguo that kind of just rolled with fully committing to economic uh, development based on a strong uh, a strong state presence, strong state direction, five year plans, and everything. A lot of mimicry of what the communists were kind of doing on the mainland and what it was working. Jiang Jingguo, his son, was doing it on Taiwan at the end. And Jiang Jingguo, there was no way Jiang Jingguo was going to be fucking the uh, come to power on the mainland when 
you had people like Li Zongren, you had people like fucking all the other former past warlords and shit still kicking around on the mainland, right? Like, the whole reason he could become leader was because in Taiwan, it was, at that point, the government was on martial law. Everyone that was elected in the Guomindang elections to be governors on each province on the mainland kept that position for life on Taiwan because of the the emergency uh, suppress the communists um, martial law condition. So you had people that were elected in the Guomindang election for like governor of Hubei fled to Taiwan and still kept his position as governor of Hubei on Taiwan for the rest of his life, right? It, it won't get renewed, <clears throat> but that was the situation that already existed in that. So obviously in those in that situation, you know, under this martial law situation, Jiang Jingguo could come into power uh, after Jiang Kai after Jiang Jieshi, Jiang Kai Shek died. So that was the whole long fucking history of it. Uh, it was pretty short by the looks of it. Three hours, my voice is pretty much gone. But fucking, yeah, I mean, if you enjoyed it, then good. That, that makes me feel good. Uh, I'm glad. I would uh, I feel pretty stoked if you enjoyed that. If you didn't enjoy it, well, fucking too bad. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but nah. Uh, hope everybody enjoyed it. Whoever's listening to it. Uh, and Billy, I answered your question. It took three hours to answer. I hope you. F- I hope the fucking god you're satisfied with this answer. All right. Sorry, sorry. Let's uh, peace out. And this, in honor of the. Uh, <clears throat> Chinese National Day, let's play us out with an outro song as well. This is going to be uh, the Mar- Steel Torrent Marching Song. Alright, enjoy everybody. Normal episodes will resume with the rest of the gang uh, next episode. See ya.